Welcome to the Great Bass Tennis Podcast, episode 117. I'm Steve Smith, and today we're going to interview Nick White. He's a new head coach at Skidmore College in Saratoga, Saratoga Springs, upstate New York. We'll go through his background. We'll go through his experiences, the dues he's paid to be a head coach, and what his vision is. And looking forward to uh, talking to him tonight, monitoring the development, the progression of Skidmore College men's tennis and helping him out as well so let me get him on the phone great guy creating a championship culture hey Steve. nick white let's hear you loud and clear great to have you as a guest thanks for taking your time to help us out thanks so much for having me Steve. i was just saying skidmore college you're the new head tennis coach. Uh, let's do this. Uh, I had some notes here on Skidmore College, but we'll go through that in a little bit. Let's go way back to where your love of tennis started. I, listeners, I should let you know, uh, I've known Nick a long time and um, excited for his new opportunity. But tell us about your beginning days in tennis. Wow, well, so I, uh, I started playing when I was about four. I uh, grew up in just outside of Boston, a uh, small town, town called Arlington, and I uh, started playing at a local club. Um, you know, just really took to it and loved it. I uh, competed locally uh, and then, you know, slowly started playing nationally, um, trained at some local academies and uh, kind of thought about, you know, some of the opportunities I had and thinking about folks like outliers. And I was lucky enough to train with some great players from, from all over the world, um, some, some top 100 ITF guys. And, um, you know, I think it made me a lot better. Um, you know, I, I slowly improved and uh, ended up getting some, some college scholarships and was kind of debating what I was going to do in tennis. And I, I ended up going to a, a school called Trinity College in Connecticut, uh, which was a strong academic and tennis school at the time. I think we were about I think about 10 in the country. Um, went there for a couple of years and then transferred and, and played at Brandeis University um, where I played, you know, number one singles and doubles. And, you know, just, just kept pushing. Um, and that actually, soon after I graduated, I went down to Florida and started playing Futures and um, ran, into, ran into you. Um and yeah, let, let's backtrack. Arlington, Mass. I played hockey with some players from Arlington, Mass. at Kimball Union Academy 50 years ago. Uh, did you play other sports or just tennis? No, I, I played everything, really, um, growing up. I uh, loved, loved soccer, loved baseball. Um, dad, you know, I, I, my dad's English, and he, he, his, his father, actually, and him taught me how to play golf when I was about nine in England. Um, so I, I just kind of played everything and slowly, you know, just kind of focused on tennis as I got older. With Trinity, there's Trinity, Texas, but Trinity, Connecticut. Um, tell us a little bit about the book Run to the Roar, the, the squash coach. You had me read that book. Run to the Roar. Yeah. What a, what a book. Um, I, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be coached by uh, Paul Espianti there. Um, and tell, to, I'm to, sorry to interrupt. Tell us the name clearly. What, what, what's the name of the author? So, so Paul Asiante was the was, is the coach currently of the squash team there, and at, at the time when I was playing tennis there, he was also the tennis coach, and he he, he wrote that book um, with with some help, I think, and yeah, it was it was really based on um, you know the the idea of kind of running to your fear and facing any fear head on, um, and, and sort of embracing adversity. Uh, he, he, he would tell, he, he tells some amazing stories, but, um, you know, one in particular that he used to tell the tennis guys, um, was about this, this player he had named Gustav, who was just the quintessential guy that, that would outwork anybody. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, unbelievably talented, but I guess relative to some of the players he was up against, he wasn't necessarily the most talented player, but he ended up, they had this unbelievable streak. Um, there and 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 it kind of came down to his match in, in a pivotal situation, and he was playing against uh, one of the best players that ever played at Princeton. Um, down in the match and and just gritted it out. Um, 
you know, in, in five sets and just, you know, one of those, one of those awesome, awesome situations, you know, David versus Goliath. And, you know, it's kind of a, a great example of, of what he wrote about the book. The, the uh, title, Run to the Roar, the, the old lion has the strong vocal cords and the old lion screams and the, the antelope turn and run to the rest of the, the pack and the lions uh, run to the roar. But a squash player, he won, squash coach, he won so many national championships. Is he still going strong there? He still is. Yeah, he's, he's a legend. Um, yeah, they're unbelievable. Um, you know, it, it sounds from one of my best friends is a squash coach, actually, at Tufts. And, and so he's kind of caught me up on the scene there. Um, but it sounds like, yeah, they're still competing for national titles year after year. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. With transferring, transferring to Brandeis, uh, we'll have to have our fact checker, Andres Barbosa. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that Bud Collins, who everybody thought he was from Boston, he was from Cleveland. He adopted Boston, his hometown, went to work, work for the Boston Globe, fell in love with Boston, Boston sports. Uh, but Brandeis, why did you transfer and how'd that work out? Yeah, you know, it, it was tough. Um, there were a lot of good things about Trinity. Um, you know, beautiful school, strong academics. Um, you know, the team was strong. I, I think it, it, eventually I kind of was looking for something a little different. Um, and, you know, I'd grown up in Boston and knew, knew Brandeis to be a strong school. Um, I liked the coach. And, you know, I, I felt like it was the right fit. Um, I looked at some other schools, some other D1s, as far as transferring and but but ended up staying local and you know made some of my best friends um at Brandeis so I was I was really fortunate Boston what a great city so many colleges in Boston that would be amazing to be able to rattle off the number of colleges in greater Boston isn't that where Christo Schultz is the coach at Brandeis that's right that's right yeah he just became the, the new head coach so um all right Christo. yeah I know I know actually I used we'll, to... we'll go ahead no, I used to train with him a little bit when we were juniors and, and play, and you know uh, he would hit in. He was at that actually academy that I was mentioning, where I was training with some of those strong, um, strong juniors from you know India and South Africa, um, and it was it was it was a pretty sweet little place. We had a, a great a great group of guys that we could kind of battle and um, make each other better. You know, with yeah, Christo. Uh... He, when, he, when he was a student at Harvard during that time, he, he spent the uh, better part of a semester with us. We were teaching him to teach tennis. And then right. from there, we sent him out to Brookhaven in, in Dallas. But yeah, we need to circle around and talk about Division Three sports. Uh, we, we need to get his father, Bud Schultz, who, who, talk about the word legend. Um, went to Bates, was a basketball player, never played a junior tournament. And I was at the, I believe Tyler, Texas, I was the first pro tournament he won, became 40 in the world. Um, but that's a great story for Division Three tennis players. With, I agree. Um, you certainly, I said in a very, very quick intro, um, you paid your dues from a coaching standpoint. I know you trained with us and played, but then shortly afterwards you got into coaching. Tell us a little bit about uh, the steps that you've taken now to be a head coach. What did you do? as assistant, as an assistant coach? Yeah. So my, my journey is, uh, you know, I, I don't know, at least felt pretty unique. Um, but I started off when I, when I got injured when I was about 21, um, and I was rehabbing, uh, from st shoulder surgery, I volunteered at a, at a small school called Batson college, um, in, in Wellesley. Um, it was, and I just loved it. Um, you know, helped with both the men's and women's teams. Um, you know, helped lead the, the men's team to the NCA. I think, for the first time that they ever made it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I coached a little bit privately after that. Um, and, then I, and then I actually started working in finance for a little while and um, was, was kind of thinking that would be, be something that would help pay the bills and, and, and be a, a good choice. Um, and, but I just felt like my passion was in tennis. So I ended up, I, I wrote to, to the assistant to the head coach at MIT um, when I was working in finance, seeing if I could uh, volunteer just part time, and he, he said absolutely. Um, I, I had actually known him from when I when I played in college and started off there. Just loved it, um, and 
I was like, you know what? I think it, I, this is this is what I want to do full time. And he ended up offering me the paid job, um, and I start I started there for you know for a couple of years, and it was amazing. Um, the team got up to I think 16 in the country, and that was the, that was the highest we had gotten in over 10 years, and helped helped make one. This kid Tyler Barr, who's a terrific player, All American, um, and, and just grew to. You know, I think something about college tennis where you, you just really feel like you get closer to the group and um, you're just a part of something bigger than yourself. You know, I, I've just, both from my experience playing, but, but now coaching, I just love it. And so I was there for, for you know, a couple of years and went down to Duke, um, helped there for a year, um, coached some just really talented kids. Um, and, you know, I worked with, Particularly, a couple guys. This kid named Spencer Furman was was one of my one of my favorite kids that I coached. Um, another kid named Ryan Dickerson. Um, just some amazing players. Uh, some of them get to national rankings. Um, the doubles was, was a blast. He, he had a good record there. I think we were fourteen three. And then uh, slowly brought, brought me back up to Boston. Um, and is it tough? Um, which we we've talked about a lot, Steve. You know. No, for sure. Um, I have to throw this in. MIT yeah. in central New York, where I spent a great deal of time. It was a two-year yeah. school called Morrisville Institute of Technology. Yeah. And all these local kids are wearing a, wearing sweatshirts proudly that say MIT. But yeah. Duke, another top school. Uh, this is a trivia question for yourself from Boston, uh, which I've asked you before. Is Where did Bobby Orr's kid go to school? Went to Duke. Went to Duke. Wow. Um, with so obviously you've been around uh, an influence on how important academics are. The balance being a student athlete. For sure. Um, For sure. Circling back, uh, your father being from Britain, did you as a kid go over Wimbledon at all? No, I think he did. Yeah, he was fortunate enough. Um, no, I, I did. You actually. Oh, did I? I, I, ha- I never got the chance. Um, I, I think at some point now I'm going to go with my dad, but I, that, that's, that's a bucket list one for me for sure. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing place. Um, with, um, with Tufts, that team climbed quite a bit while you were there, correct? Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Uh, I think I started, I started there in 2019, and we were 21 at the time. Um, when I started off, I met I met some of the guys on the team, um, and I was super impressed by them. Um, I just felt like, man, I think we could do something special. Uh, worked really hard. We we I was fortunate enough to, to come into a to a really good culture, and felt like we, we really just kept making it better. Um, you know, we got up from we went from twenty one two thousand nineteen and twelve uh, the, the the next year. Um, and then last year we got up to three in the country, uh, and the NCAA semis, um, which was the first time in program history. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was an it was an awesome experience. I, I still talk to those guys all the time. And I yeah. know that I know that you were troubled in leaving there; that you wanted to stay there longer. Um, tell us a little bit about that, and then making the decision to uh, accept a job at Skidmore. Yeah, that was a hard one. Um, you know, with, with with the climb that we had and, and just felt like, you know, the process that we went through, um, you know, the first year that we had, I, I honestly felt like we were going to win it with a national championship my first year. Um, we had the number one player in the country. Um, our number two player was just incredible. Um, you know, last year he was three in the country. Um, our, our three was, this, was top, top, I think he was 175 ITF and won one of the strongest invitationals in the fall. And then in the spring, we got two matches in. We won the first two matches and the COVID hit. And we got that season canceled. And that was probably one of the most gut-wrenching experiences coaching-wise and probably in my life, honestly. Um, and just going through that with them was, was, was I don't know, was, we were a real family. Well, you're a young um, guy. How, how old are you now? I'm 34. 34. 34 so, years old. Yeah. You're my yeah. age. That's very young, 34. 
Uh, and you, you, re, you recruited one of our players at Tufts, a young Arush Ganji. We spent many years working with him. Uh, I think that he has a, a fundamental base. He, he step up and get super fit and be aggressive. It's like when Nadal was asked, how do you beat Nadal? He very quickly said, that's easy. Don't miss and be super aggressive. <laughs> and, uh, right. With, uh, but he's just a freshman now. Um, yeah. How, with um, being a head coach, I mean, you, I, I've got written down here your conference and the schools in your conference. Uh, you could correct me on some of my notes here, but that's kid yep. more up. You set your own schedule, so you would be able to down the road play tops, right? Yeah, yeah. But Carl and I are actually trying to make that happen this year. So, um, what's Carl's last name again? I talked to him a couple times. Carl Gregor. Yeah, um, great, great coach. Play, played at um, Air Force and. Yeah, so we'll make that happen. Um, it'll be hard to play against. I'm not going to lie. We had uh, this fall, our, 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 our top player played in, in this tournament, the Middlebury Invitational, and had a great run. He made it to the finals, and he actually had to play against uh, this kid named Rashad, Rashad, Rashad Sharda, excuse me, um, who's, who's the number one player at Tufts. And one of, the, one of the kids I was probably closest to there, and <laughs> it was hard coaching against him, I'm not going to lie. Uh, you know, two months ago, I, I, I thought I was probably going to be coaching, coaching him. And the next thing you know, I'm on the other side of the net, but, um, that was a blast. Um, so yeah. All these schools, Middlebury, uh, I was on that campus back in the day. Uh, so colleges had two, two hockey teams because freshmen couldn't play varsity. And then they, yep. ke they kept the second, the, the developmental team for a long time, the freshmen and sophomores. And our prep right. team would play, not Middlebury's varsity, but Middlebury's de developmental team. What a beautiful place! I know that they had to be doing something right. They've won uh, national championships in many, many sports. No, yeah, that's a great. That's a great school. Really good program. Um, yeah, their coach Andrew Thompson is. You know, player actually. You know, I was there, and we, you know, we, you know, we're friendly and. He's uh he's a great he's a great coach. He just started being the head coach there, and but yeah, that that team has just churned out national championships. So yeah, I, I know uh, Dave Schwartz. He came to hang out with us a couple of different times. Um, upstate New York guy went to Cornell. He he won a national championship there, and then uh, his successor was Hanson. I can't remember his first name. I believe it was Hanson. Bob, 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 Bob yeah. Hanson. He yeah, coached forever yeah. out in Southern Cal with a Division Three team, and then he went to Middlebury. Um, with uh, and obviously that's what you want to do. You want to create a championship culture and win that and that the national championship, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. That's why I uh, why I took this, this, the job at Skidmore for sure. Um, I think it's I think it's an amazing place and opportunity. Um, we're gonna we're gonna build actually a brand new facility um, this spring. So we'll have eight beautiful courts with lights and stands, and, and then we're going to have four really nice indoors with a locker room and gym. Um, so I think it's going to be one of the best facilities in the country. Um, so I think coupled with, with the academics and, and Saratoga, which is just a gorgeous town, you know, I think it's a special place. So, you know, really uh, looking yeah, to bring I've got in my notes, uh, I know it's a pretty, pretty place. I used to hitchhike through Saratoga. Um, it was uh, our prep school had the rule. It was against the rule, against the school rules to hitchhike. But I remember we, we used to get dropped off at the bus station, and then the the support staff from our prep school would leave, and a few of us uh, we would just on an individual basis because we're going in different directions. But we would just you know save the bus fare and hitchhike. But I remember you know, we'd hitchhike through Saratoga with um, being a head coach. Uh, how long yeah. do you think it would take to, you know, have a, a championship team? Um, I think with our listeners, uh, it'll take you as quite a few years to have all your own players there. You hear college coaches talk about that. So, I mean, you have some seniors, perhaps you could tell us, break it down. I mean, that means they've been there three years, their fourth, your first year is their fourth year and the juniors, their um, third, third year is your first year and so on and so on. Um, how long do you think it would take to build a, a national championship culture? Or I should no. say, a, not the culture itself, but I mean, you try to want to build that from day one, but 
but to win, to win that championship. Yeah, you know, honestly, Steve, I think you, you know, <laughs> your your word choice is actually probably right. I think, I think it really starts with the culture. Um, you know, how how much extra work are the guys putting in? Um, how much are they working on aspects of their game? You know, are, are they somebody that makes other people around them better? Um, you know, we've, we've got some really good players. Um, you know, some of, some of the, the cap, a couple of captains that we have here. Um, you know, super talented. Um, but I think I think it's I think it's a mentality. Um, I think you know I, I I actually was back at Tufts a couple of weeks ago, um, and I had had lunch with Forrest Sorkin, who was our the number one player in the country that that I coached there, and he said it really well when we were when we were driving. Um, he said he felt like the mentality of the team has changed, um, where you know you start beating the top teams, and, and then all of a sudden you just your belief just changes. It just it just there's no fear. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it comes from a lot of things. I think it comes from preparation. I think it comes from, you know, being really strategic and just focusing on playing a really tactical game and, um, you know, not, not worrying about who you're playing against. And then as you, you know, you start to rack up wins and, you know, your teammates are, are just doing the same thing and you have a great system. You know, I, I think that's when you start creating that championship culture. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm eager to do that. I think, you know, this year we, we have a pretty small team. Uh, I, I, you know, I may have some really good transfers coming in, but I'm going to graduate three players. Um, I'll have three remaining. Um, and then, you know, we'll see what transfers I get in. But I'm looking to bring in a strong, you know, large recruiting class, probably around eight guys. Um, and I think a lot of it will, will, you know, be the guys that are here. But then, really comes from from some of the guys who come in and and coming right in off the bat and being hungry and you know honestly Steve using a lot of the stuff that you taught me um especially tactically a lot of the film film review and and both tactically and technically so let's go back to this on division three when you came to work with us I remember like to tell people again total recall recall totally what I want to but you, you hit the ball really well so obviously you were taught well I mean your game I remember it was like you just needed band-aids. It wasn't major surgery. It wasn't like you had like major holes in your game. You know, and I always tell people, you have to realize that there's a lot of division three teams that could have beat division one teams. And you certainly, my recollection is you could have played division one tennis with uh, the band-aid work versus the major surgery work. Um, for our listeners, um, you know, so you have seniors versus incoming freshmen. Uh, are you going about that differently because you have somebody who's just got basically um, 32 weeks under your leadership and then they're, they're done 16 weeks a semester. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, I think you said it right. I think that's the, that's kind of one of the internal debates that I've had, you know, myself as well as, you know, working in other schools where you kind of are trying to figure out, you know, what you leave alone and what you try and improve. And then you also think about your timeline. So, I think generally I, tr I try to make changes mostly within people's game um, rather than kind of, like, like you said, kind of those band-aid changes um, and try and do that more in the fall than in the spring. Um, and, I, and I think it's great when you get a kid, especially as a freshman, and you start doing that. Um, I, think, I think the less time you have, it gets harder. Um, and, and, and at that point, I, I, I lean towards um, you know, really trying to help them tactically. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I really try and look for kids to come in and have a strong base, um, have technically sound strokes and, and are really athletic. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't focus so much on the kids that are necessarily the highest rec recruits, you know, um, you know, obviously we were fortunate at top, you know, we had the top recruiting class last year, but it was, you know, a lot of the kids that we bring in, you know, are the kids we've seen on film and we think are, um, you know, are, are guys that are going to keep just kind of hitting the ground running. Whereas, you know, you get guys who have huge holes in their game, it gets a lot harder. Um, which isn't to say that they can't be great players. I just think, you know, I, I tend to lean towards finding kids that maybe have even a lower ranking, but I think are more solid technically and are good athletes rather than the kid who's you know, maybe really strong recruiting, you know, ranking wise, but 
has has a bunch of holes, you know. This summer, I was at the Clay Court Nationals for the the eighteens, and it it seemed like I saw more Division three coaches there. I always thought that one of the reasons they weren't there was just a lack of of a, a budget for recruiting. Um, what what are the the number one ways to recruit uh, when you're uh, you just don't have the the budget of uh, Ohio State or uh, Texas these huge schools? Yeah, I mean, I think that the big thing I do is that, you know there there isn't anybody who's going to come here as a recruit or transfer who has who I haven't seen film on. So, you know, I, that's the first thing I ask for from a kid is is what he what what does he play like? What is, how does he compete? What are his strokes like? How does he move? You know, two years ago, I was at Tufts and, and Carl and I were, were kind of putting together our recruiting class. And there was a great player from, um, you know, just outside of Serbia. And he had just phenomenal strokes. Uh, not, not not the highest ranking, but I, I remember saying to Carl, this kid's going to be a stud, you know. And, you know, he played three for us his first year. Just huge serve. Serve really reminded me of Ash, honestly. Um you know, great slider. Um, and yeah, so I, I think, I think the big thing is really just being able to see kids on film. Um, and then from there, you know, having, having a lot of calls, getting to know what they're like as a, as a person, their character and, and their goals. And then you try know? to get them in for a visit. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think getting them in, getting to see them, um, in person and, and, you know, you know, what are they like? Are they somebody that, you know, you think the guys are going to feed off of, you know, they all, you know, have a good team dinner. They can stay for an overnight, you know, they, they can hit some balls with the guys. You know, I, I think, I think when you bring in guys and you feel like, Hey, this, this kid's just somebody that's going to make the other guys better. You know, that's when, you know, you, you, you have somebody that, that, you know, could really be a, be a big part of the program. Well, I know you're, you're new at, at Skidmore, but you've worked at so many colleges already. What about home visits? Is the budget in line for you to make home visits? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's one thing I'm also doing is, is doing a lot of fundraising. So, so I can really do go the extra mile and get some of these top kids. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, I think going to, going to seeing a kid and, and meeting them and talking to their family, um, it's huge. So absolutely. You know, it, it's just, it really comes down to how much of an impact player you think the kid is, you know? No, the great late Bear Bryant used to always say, "You got, you got to get in the living room, got to have a meal at the kid's house, and see how the how the kid uh, responds, relates to their parents." Actually, going way back uh, when we started out the podcast with Andy Fitzell, we interviewed Scotty Perelman right after Florida won the national championship, and right. you know he he just says so many things about recruiting and, and the kid's character. People, people could go back and listen to that. With, um, tell us some, a few things about the fall. The, the rules are different, correctly, uh, correct? Don't you start stop practice uh, pretty early in November? Yeah, it's a little weird. I mean, it's a little different in Division Division One in that way, where you know you can keep working with the guys more over the over the break. You know, um, you know, in D three, you know, the big thing that you have to rely on is having great leaders. So. You know, they, those leaders are setting up consistent captain's practices, workouts. Um, you know, you can still work with the guys if, you know, they go and play a tournament and they film it. You know, you can go over it. So I think there's ways that you can that you can continue to help these guys really improve. Um, and I think you just need to be creative. You know, I, I, I unfortunately, I think it's a shame just given that, you know, if a kid wants to get better, I, I why not let him get better? But, you know, it is what it is. Um, I, I think a, a hungry coach is, is still able to do it really well. Um, you just have to, again, like you said, set, set up, um, set up captain's practices once that, that start of, sorry, the, um, the November, uh, end, um, and then, you know, get them working hard, get them working on different aspects of the game. Um, and then, you know, come spring, you know, making sure they're really fit, you know? Well, there's many schools, to back up a little bit here, there's many schools over the years, colleges, universities, that have told recruits that they're going to have this new facility. And then the joke is, you know, now they've, you know, their their kids are married and now they have their kids and it's, 
see, two, 20 years goes by and there's no new facility, but it's, it's pretty much a sure thing. They're going to break ground and you're going to have your own indoor courts. Yeah. I mean, I, that was a big part in why I took the job, if I'm being honest, Steve. I think, um, you know, I knew it's a great program and it's an unbelievable, it's an unbelievable area. Um, I actually came up with my father and, you know, we drove around. I was just, I was really impressed by the campus and the town and, you know, there's some, it's really fun. You know, also there's some horse racing up here. We went, we went during horse racing and we we're just having a blast. And I said to my dad, I said, well, you know, but where are the indoor courts? And, and, you know, the truth is we have indoor courts like five minutes off campus. So, so we're able to play a lot, but, you know, I said to him, you know, to be able to recruit, you know, I really need some, some great indoor courts. And 10 minutes into my interview, they said, here, the, these are the plans. This is happening. You know, we're breaking ground this spring. So you're going to be playing, you know, at, at that club that's about five minutes away. Um, all my home matches this year are going to be there. And then, so we'll have the brand new outdoor ready for next fall. And then right after that, they're breaking ground on the indoor. So, yeah, it's happening. Um, the alums have been super, super passionate about it. You know, it's, I, I think it's really going to be a pro- program changer, you know. Well, it's very good that the, in, the indoor courts at the club are close by. I know a lot of schools, um, you know, I always tell kids when they're, looking at a school, there's obviously so many things that are, um, on the checklist, but, you know, do they have to drive 20, 30 minutes to practice to, you know, the winters are long in the Northeast. Um, what type of facility is that that's nearby? It's great. I mean, so it's the YMCA of Wilton. Um, and we have, we have six indoor, um, wow. we actually have a more, get more, uh, big, big, on the side of the wall for the courts. I mean, it's, it's really nice, really nice indoor courts. It's just, you know, that again, the proximity of being able to kind of roll out of bed and go hit some balls is, is great rather than kind of having to jump in the car. So, you know, it'll just be easier, right? No, I mean, control to have your own courts. Um, and then also, too, early on, you got to fight the battles that, uh, you know, granted, um, you know, there's the alumni, there's the students, some special interest groups. But you, right. you certainly, and I'm sure that will be the case, that the team will have priority. Um, there are some schools where only the only the players on the team, the coach has total access. You know, there's no community uh, program or um, outside programs, even for, even people that are working as a faculty member or a student. The courts are just for the players. But uh, right. The, I know that uh, I have some students I've trained that they always the teams always have at least one indoor court, so they have their set hours for practice. But then there's always one court for the team. But you have to when a place is new, I have to get in line. Go, okay, what are going to be the the rules and regulations, the policies and procedures? How's how's this uh, how's this ship going to sail? Yeah. And, and it's so important early on to have those rules be laid out for what you want to build there. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, no, we'll have, we'll have for, for sure. We're going to have priority and be able to train wherever, whenever we want. Um, you know, I, I, again, I think we'll, we'll continue to work on the details, but again, you know, our AD is phenomenal. Um, and you know, she knows how much of, you know, a priority it is for us to have those indoor. And, um, you know, again, having, having the ability to, to play whenever we want so so we'll certainly be able to do that um you know as you you know as we always talk about the hungry dog hunts that so if you got a hungry kid and he can't play and he doesn't have the court it's like you know it kills it right so um yeah these, these guys are gonna be able to play whenever they want so it'll it'll be awesome oh that's great hungry dog hunts best uh, for our listeners with all our free educational content i, I know nick uh i asked him about our podcast or our Instagram and, and you've said many times you just keep watching tennis intelligence applied over and over again uh, when we put that together we thought people would do that young coaches we thought okay approximately 365 clips one per day and just okay just watch it and watch it because uh, there's you know people have to understand it's rich in history I mean where does where does the information come from um but let me let me do this so my notes go through it quickly on Skidmore. Um, yeah. Maybe I'll say something that uh, you don't know. Skidmore College, 120 clubs, 44 majors, 2700 students, 
43 states, 60 countries. I've seen the academic polls. It's it's always ranked high. I know growing up in upstate New York myself that, you know, I'd always knew that Skidmore was a highly acclaimed liberal arts college. With, um, you guys are um, nine men's teams, 10 women's teams. You're the thoroughbreds. When we're green and gold, and green and gold for me, upstate New York, Clarkson College. I'm a native of Potsdam, New York. Clarkson, green and gold. Actually, Oswego, Oswego State, where I went to uh, school for hockey, they're green and gold. But your equestrian, the riding team, the girls, 26 people on the roster, they've won eight national titles. So that's a few things about Skidmore. A few more here. Saratoga Springs, New York. It's known for health, history, and horses. Health, is in the, the theme is health through water. 15 spas, everybody, within two miles. So you got to go visit Nick White in Saratoga. The, the, the Roosevelt Spa, uh, President Roosevelt, um, FDR. I have to go to our tech, fact checker. I don't think it was Teddy. Um, maybe it was Teddy. But uh, anyway, the Roosevelt Spa in history. Your dad should know this being a Brit that the the uh, perhaps the turning point of the Revolutionary War was the Battle of Saratoga, 1777. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story about that. The three-way attack on Albany or the, the three British generals. I one time I had a teacher. She left the room. I had to go down the hall and told us to read these these six paragraphs or whatever. And I probably was the one who started the, pop, the paper fight. So she came back in, family friend, very close to my mother. And she said, all right, everybody take out a piece of paper, write down the three generals, the three British generals. And I wrote down the three hockey players, how, how Hall and Makita. And she just said, if you don't get one of them, right, you're going to have to do this, this, and this. And I was, <laughs> The girls, of course, they were doing the reading and, and they passed the test, but the boys, we failed the quiz. And But anyway, uh, it was just a, I put down general how, I just put down how, and there was a general how. But uh, just besides um, health history, and again, it was 1777, horses, Saratoga, known for horses, oldest sports venue in the United States. I just did a little homework on this. Saratoga Springs Lincoln was uh, at the first horse race at the at the, the venue that's the oldest. A million guests per year. It's hard to believe in upstate New York that they have 11 months where they race horses. That's um, crazy. The, uh, but yeah, health history and horses. And yeah, quaint, beautiful town. Keep going here in this uh, Skidmore quiz here. You can see there's a casino, beautiful parks, five-star restaurants, lots of bars with live music, lots of outdoor activities, lots of concerts, performing arts, uh, performing arts center, several museums. Let's take Skidmore. Um, with uh, get down uh, two famous people. There's so many famous people that either through Saratoga Springs or through uh, Skidmore. Edgar Allan Poe and Eddie Cahill. Do you know who Eddie Cahill is? I heard that name. He's an actor. So first of Edgar Allan Poe. There's a yeah. famous hotel. It's uh, you know, it's now a, I believe a museum. But uh, just a quick glance on Saratoga Springs. But Edgar Allan Poe uh, horror stories and detective stories and the poem The Raven. He. Uh, He's an, he's an interesting guy, Edgar Allan Poe. But Eddie Cahill, he went to um, Skidmore. He was a, he was the goalie. He played he played Jim Craig in the movie, Miracle. Miracle on Ice. Uh, yeah, yeah. 29,000 people, approximately twenty nine thousand people. Saratoga Springs is a beautiful place. Uh, yeah. How far is it from Albany? Like thirty minutes. People commute, right? Yeah, thirty minutes. Yeah. A lot of people who work in Albany who live in Saratoga and just commute, you know, it's a good area. With, um, so let, let's go through uh, the, you know, conference and competition. Um, 
your travel budget, you know, spring break. Um, when you, you're putting your schedule together, right here, I've got your conference, uh, St. Lawrence, Canton, New York. I grew up 10 miles away from St. Lawrence. There's RPI, great hockey school. There's Skidmore, Vassar, William Smith, Ithaca College, University of Rochester. Young guy who I taught how to hit a ball, uh, Matt Nielsen. He's a coach, uh, both teams, I believe, at the University of Rochester. Um, really? Yeah, with, with um, competition, you know, I know in – Division one, you have 25 days where you play matches. The coaches for, in college tennis for 15 years, they, they played no ad. And the coaches yeah. didn't really complain, but they could play as many, many matches as they wanted. They have complained about no ad with the, the 25 days where you only play 25 matches. How about yourself when you put a schedule together? How many, um, how many times do you play a conference team? Do you play home away? I mean, do you... Um, have a limitation, I mean, financial, I mean, as far as number of matches you can put together? Yeah, you know, I thankfully that, you know, we haven't really had the so far in, as far as matches. Um, you know, you know, we created a great spring break. We go to California and play some good teams out there. Um, we, you know, like you said, all those teams in the conference were required to play them every year, um, which I think is good fun. I mean, it, you know, I, Seems like every every team these days is getting better. Um, RPI has improved a lot in the last five years. Um, Hobart, same same thing. Um, and you know, so everybody's kind of pushing pushing each other. Uh, and, and then you know, we, we I try to put together the strongest schedule I can. You know, out of conference, so we'll play teams like Middlebury, Bowden, Amherst. Uh, you know, we'll try and get Tufts on there this year. Um, you know, lots of the top 10 teams in the country. Um, I, I'd say we probably play a mix of, you know, three to five teams between one and 10, three to five teams between 10 and 20, and, and another three to five teams between 20 and 30, um, in addition to those teams in the Liberty League. So you, you mentioned, you, know, you mentioned Hobart in the Liberty, yeah. the Liberty League that were my, Quick research. Uh, Hobart was not listed, but they're part of the Liberty League. They are, yeah. Hobart, William Smith, and we, yeah, they 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 they've been improving a lot in the last few years. Um, so they're they're in there. Vassar, I, I think you mentioned Vassar, but um, Hobart, William Smith yeah. is at now one school. Oh gosh, I, I should um, I have to do a little homework on that too. But I, I think it is. I mean, at least tennis wise, I think it's considered one. And I know. It's always that's the title, so I would assume so. With and I, I missed it. Uh, I didn't hear you clearly. That you do play home and away. You play just once a year or twice a year with the league school, the league schools, the conference schools. We'll play every team in the conference once, um, and then you know, in in the conference championship, we could play them. You know, depending on where we get seated, we'll play them again. Um, and you know, each year we'll do a. We'll just do like a reciprocal home and away with a lot of the uh, out of conference teams, and so we'll play, you know, some teams in Boston one year, and then the next year they'll come here, um, and then same thing within our within our conference. So you know, it works well, and I think it's nice for the guys to kind of see different parts of the country as well, especially from the international guys, you know. And how an international is Division Three now? No, it's getting more and more. It's, it's awesome. Um, you know, at Tufts, we were almost half half guys from the U.S., half guys from out of out of the country, and I think it just makes the culture so much better. You know, having players from from different different perspectives. Um, I think I think everybody has a. It just gives everybody more of an appreciation for everything. Um, you know, here we have. Um, let's see, we have two guys. You know, who who were who grew up out of, out of the country. We have one, well, really three, you know, one, one from Japan, another from Sweden, another one from Romania and England. So, you know, I just think, I just think having a, a you know, a melting pot of different schools, and, uh, excuse me, you know, nationalities just makes for a better program. Many years ago, uh, Christopher Swantonson, Beck show Sweden, mispronouncing that though, famous tennis town. I think they have, uh, 88 ATP titles in Vexho. v is from there. He played at Stetson. I remember his mother telling me that um, he had played with so many K-1 
kids from so many different countries over four years, and it really helped him. Uh, this is many years ago, he's the same age as my son, Connor. It helped him break into uh, international banking. The people that were interviewing him were so impressive, so impressed that uh, um, I do think that, you know, you think about international flavor, it's amazing. Skidmore has 60 schools. Um, no place like home. I wouldn't mind going back up to upstate New York. I did not know that you had a hockey team. It started in 1983, but uh, maybe I could come back up there and be the Zamboni driver. That would be a good job to retire with. Oh, come on, come on. Take, take, take care of the ice. Um, <laughs> oh, our, our listeners, uh, I have talked to uh, to Nick, uh, whether it be uh, a couple weeks or more than that, to come up there and help you run a summer camp. With Tell us a little bit more about fundraising. Is that mandatory? Is that just optional? Uh, what do you have to do in those lines, along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's kind of strongly encouraged. I mean, borderline mandatory. I, I, I think I would consider mandatory. I think... Um, you know, I, I the more the more you do it, the more you get alumni involved and in kind of having having a part of the process and progress of the team. I think it's huge. Um, you know, this year we did, um, you know, a big fundraising push uh, called All, All in the Win, where you know we we kind of called on alums to help support us for spring break and you know new uniforms. You know, it could be a coaching budget. Um, you know, so yeah, it's huge. I think you know, and, and it's fun though. I, because, you know, I honestly, I don't, you know, some people are like, you know, the first thing they want to do when they talk to, a, to an alum is, you know, ask for money. But I, I think that the, the great part about it, when you start talking to the alums, you hear the stories that they have, you know, about the team, you know, about their time there. And, you know, it makes you feel like more of a part of a family. So, yeah, I mean, I've done it a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I have actually a call tomorrow talking to one of our, our, our strongest alums and, it's huge, you know, getting them involved, you know, in any way that we can. Um, you know, one of the other ways that I've gotten the alums involved here, which, you know, I'm, I'm starting to, is I'm going to have them be anyone who's interested in sort of being mentors for the for the players. So, you know, they can come in and start talking to an alum who's really successful in, in the respective field that they're interested in, and then that can help them get an internship or a job post-grad um, and you know, kind of have a, have a great path as they're in college. So, um, you know, getting them really involved is huge. You know, having gone to a prep school in New England, and then I also, I mean, I taught tennis at Deerfield Prep and then the Choate School. The small schools are so nice. Um, and then so that, that's, I mean, that's Skidmore. But one of, one of the challenges, uh, is certainly for you, is the cost, correct? It's cost uh, of what? Cost to go to Skidmore. I mean, yeah. Division Three for our listeners is uh, there's no athletic aid, there's no athletic scholarships. I mean, um, right. exactly. so yeah. What are your What are your thoughts on that with the, the tuition? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I, you know, I think a lot of it, excuse me, comes from you know we get great financial aid for a lot of these kids, so. You know, I think a lot of guys kind of look at that in a way like a scholarship, um, you know, even though it's not the same thing. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's helping, you know, help pay for their tuition. You know, it's crazy these days. You know, tuition's getting up somewhere between seventy and 80000 It's like, you know, when I was in college, I remember thinking 50000 was insane. So, um, yeah, but, the, you know, we're fortunate at Skidmore. We've had great, we have great financial aid. And we're, you know, we're at, so I'm able to end up getting kids that, you know, do need some support. And, you know, they're kind of hoping that their tenants can help provide, you know, either a scholarship or some way for them to, to, to offset that cost. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm able to bring in some kids that, that, you know, it's important and it's huge, you know, so I, I'll, I, yeah, I mean, it's it's been really really strong the the financial aid. So that that's kind of D3's way of of helping um, financially with roster management. Um, can you have as many players as you would like, or is there a limitation on that? No, no, there's no roster limitation. The um, I think it really just comes down to the, the, the preference of the coach. Um, I think I'd probably want somewhere between 10 to 12 in that range. Um, 
have some good competition and big enough where, you know, you get lots of different players you can compete against and practice and practice with. And then, um, you know, also at the same time, small enough that, you know, you have tons of time to really help those players develop. I think with uh, coming back to the previous question, the cost of the school, uh, players have to find a way. I've heard that expression or, or the years have gone by as the, the parents find a way um, to, to make to make it happen with. But you have blind admissions, right? In other words, when someone someone's ex accepted, then then you have to deal with the financial side of it. Is that right? Well, you know, honestly, we we, we get into we, we do pre reads and part of the pre read is, is is that financial piece. And then you know, I'm not sure exactly how much I, I'm able to divulge, but um, basically that I, I get a certain amount of players I'm able to support who need that financial aid. Um, and then some who are able to pay the full tuition, you know, it, it's easier to, to, to support them and, and get them in. But I'm able to support, you know, a few players each year um, who need that aid. Um, and, and, and that ends up kind of being a game changer for me. Let me throw another uh, challenging question I would think that you face. Um, but I, I see that you have 44 majors. Um, I didn't really go into any depth in my quick glance at Skidmore College and Saratoga Springs. Um, Anderson Cooper, you know, one mm -hmm. thing about uh, Anderson Cooper, uh, he went to Yale and I like to listen to commencement speeches. And during his commencement speech, at his alma mater, he said that uh, liberal arts means no skills. Um, and you, you hear people say, you know, why would you want to go to a liberal arts school? But but uh, could you comment on that with 44 different majors? And uh, I mean, how would you answer that when someone takes that type of shot? Yeah, I mean, gosh, everybody has different perspective. I, I, I think that, you know, you find the majority of people find that liberal arts is, is, is really a way of exploring different interests that you have. Um, you know, you, you don't have to necessarily declare your major right off the bat. Um, but you can kind of explore, Hey, you know, I, I want to major in business, so I'm going to take some business classes. Um, or, you know, I want to, I want to see like political science. And, and I think that that way of being able to explore your different interests is, is incredibly valuable. Um, I know going to a liberal arts school, it was, it was, it was great to get to do that and, and, and understand different different interests that I have, but I think at other schools, I wouldn't have ever had that opportunity. Um, you know, and, and one of the nice things about Skidmore, unlike some other liberal arts schools is we actually have a great business major. So, um, you know, a lot of places when, you know, you go to a liberal arts school, to, to play, you know, you have to major in economics, which, which is great. But I, I think it's, for me, it's felt a little theoretical. Um, and so at, at, more. It has a terrific business major and it's been very popular. So I think it's a combination of, of, of being able to explore your interests in some of those other liberal arts majors um, and you know, also having some, some great other majors like business and being able to go down that road as well. With, I, I can't really I, nail, uh, nail this straight um, how the story plays out, but um, Anderson Cooper couldn't get a job and he, you know, it's very, very wealthy kid. I think Gloria Vanderbilt was his mother. Anyway, um, my fact checker has to help me out, you know, senior moment, but from memory that during the Persian Gulf war, he bought used video equipment and he went to the front lines where the bullets were flying and that's how he got his start. So with that, um, so many things, 85% of people don't work in the field that they studied in. I do think when it comes down to someone knows they want to be, you know, an engineer or they want to be a, uh, you know, in medicine, they want to be a doctor, they want to be a lawyer. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, a shot that, um, um, people take all the time. I think how many 18 year olds really know what they want to do? Um, right. I know that was something that helped me out at the age of 19. I said, okay, I could make a living studying tennis. And it was kind of a, 
you know, people were trying to talk me out of it. Like, what are you doing? I mean, I absolutely loved ice hockey, but it was like, well, this, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, of course I had a brother who started studying ice hockey and, um, back in my day, so many years ago, if you wanted to be in sports, you pretty much would study PE and then coach after school. Um, but yeah. the, 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 the tennis boom came along and there's there so many things, uh, Mark Twain, you know, don't let the classroom interfere with your education. But, uh, yeah, I just think those things that those are challenges that you would be asked is, you know, the, the cost, is it really worth it? And, you know, it's a liberal arts degree, but I think that's where you, uh, have to do your homework and find, find, help people find ways to make it work on the financial side. And, and then all the successful stories of, uh, not only people that went to Skidmore, but, uh, that, you know, again, people don't out of the, out of the gate, start at age 18, knowing what they want to do. Right. Right. No, exactly. There's a, there's a list usually every year also that comes out where it talks about like the value of the actual school, that the education that you get, that, you know, how much it value it creates for the rest of your life career wise. And every year Skidmore comes in very high. So, you know, I think that that speaks to the, the fact that, you know, that the education you get here, you know, will set you up job wise and educationally for life. So, you know, as far as the return on investment, I think it's, it's incredibly strong. Um, you know, you'd laugh. One of the things that I was taught, <laughs> I learned on my interview was, you know, some of you, some of the listeners may have watched Ice Age, and uh, the person who who created that script and and all the characters went to Skidmore, and uh, that squirrel that would run around, um, you know, in that movie was actually based on a squirrel that would run around campus. So, um, you know. He, he did pretty well right so you know, um yeah it's pretty neat well let me backtrack on on my plugging uh anderson cooper let me do this for one of my sons who's a conservative okay cnn creating nonsense now um <laughs> with uh with, that's not fair we'll have to come back with a positive i like acronyms i mean you know especially with kids that have short names coach yep. coach the girl nina never invite nina anywhere I one time listened to a comedian and actually you working at MIT, um, he had an acronym for every state. The only one I could remember was Iowa. I idiots out wandering around. Uh, but, you know, but you could turn that around to intellectuals out wandering around. But he had one for Massachusetts. He actually had an acronym um, for MIT spelled all the way out with every letter. Um, it's wow. just, just, just amazing. Gotta got have, oh, yeah. got have a little bit of humor. Um, I think that's one thing too. Is coming back to challenging questions. I get so tired of kids going D one D one D one. I want to play D one D one D one, and they've never even seen a D one match. And right. you know, Vic Braden used to always say, "You got to go where you're wanted." I've had too many boys, especially the Macho Male Ego. I remember having two kids went. They went to Notre Dame, and Bobby Bayless is a great guy, and he kept sixteen guys on his team, give or take. And Butch Page, who um, Dr. Hugh Page, uh, last I knew, great friend from way back when. He's a dean of freshmen at Notre Dame, and forever he was a volunteer men's coach. And um, so these two young guys that I worked with, they went to Notre Dame, and I said, I would not go to Notre Dame. I would go to a, there's so many great Division three schools from an academic standpoint, but they went and they didn't play. They, you know, I mean, I, you don't want to take the, 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 uh, the wind out of someone's sails, but, you know, you pretty much can have a, a, a crystal ball on uh, a fairly good crystal ball. I like to tell people my crystal ball is a little better than most on, you know, where, where is, where is this story headed with your tennis? Uh, but why don't you comment on that? I mean, how do you deal with that where, you know, kids uh, D one, D one, D one, and you're talking to them about your D three program. That's a good question, Steve. I, I love it. Honestly, I, um, you know, I, I think, Approaching both levels, I think one of the big things I see is there's really not much of a difference. It's, it's more about um, who hit more balls, honestly, um, sense of inner belief, um, and how well somebody's coached, honestly. I mean, if, if you can hit the ball well and you're coached well, you can beat anybody. I mean, honestly, I, I think um, it's just about how much you believe in yourself. Um, so, I mean, I mean, good example, you know, Isaac, Isaac Gorlick, you know, I'll, I'll give it throw a name out there, but, you know, our number one player last year at, at Tufts, you know, is a three-star player, 
Um, you know, he's probably top 200 tennis recruiting. Um, and, you know, but was passed up by tons of schools and he didn't, didn't get a lot of D1, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of D1 looks and, you know, worked his butt off, you know, started off playing three and four, um, you know, just, kept, you know, I can remember the meeting him, you know, the first time and we just talked about, you know, what did he want to get better at? He wanted to get better at his volleys and his serves, you know, and so we filmed both of those. We, we got to work and got so much better at it. Got a lot better at coming forward and get an unbelievable forehand and just worked really hard for, for his whole career and went from, you know, three to four um, to then up to two, you know, being a great, you know, he got to play 40 in the country his first this the first year I was there that he was top, I think top 20 and you know, All-American his second year that I was there. And then the last year he got three in the country and, and now he's playing at Stanford, you know, and it's just like, you know, it, it's all about how, how, how much you want it, how much you believe and, and, you know, how much you develop and, you know, um, you know, another name we had is a kid, his name Rashab, you know, as mentioned before, but I mean, he had an offer at, at Columbia and he, you know, he got a better, better deal at Tufts and he came, came to Tufts. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not about the D1 versus D3. I think you know, there's some unbelievable D1 programs out there um, with, with great coaches. And, but I think it really just comes down to what has the best environment and where are you going to get the best, uh, you know, what, where are you going to, at the end of your career, feel like you have developed the most. Um, and I think that should be the question most of the players are asking themselves, you know, is do I feel like when I go to this school, you know, when I look back, you know, whether if I go pro, you know, or, you know, or I get a great degree, you know, over those four years, how good did I get? You know, how much did I play? How, how good did I get? And I think I think that's the question, you know, juniors should be asking themselves, um, you know, that, 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 if that makes sense. Peter Smith, the American Peter Smith, there's an Australian Peter Smith, both uh, highly acclaimed tennis coaches. Peter Smith, America, who's a former coach at USC. I love how he said uh, Division Three is uh, the soul of college tennis. One of our pillars, Jim Verdick. Uh, people need to go back, and we dedicated a podcast or two to Jim Verdick. Then we um, had his son, Doug, Redlands Division Three, won 15 national championships. During his tenure, they did switch from – NAIA to Division Three or Division Three to NAIA, but um, he won without scholarship players. Um, right. Actually, Bud Schultz, another person to talk to, uh, get him on our podcast. Uh, amazing story. He's kind of like a, a folk hero. Is that uh, Eric Buter back, back? He played at uh, ben, Ball State for a year, then he went back home and played at because Steve was at Dolphus. And right. uh, I was telling a story the other day because. Um, I was with Andres Barbosa, and he mentioned Florida International. And I said, well, I'll tell you a story. I played a tournament there. And in the first round, I played a guy from Gustavus Adolphus. And I won the match. And it was an early morning match, 8 o'clock. And there was a marathon. It started at noon. Miami right. Marathon. And this kid, with one of our teammates who lost, these two guys went and they ran the Miami Marathon. So in the same day... So it was Saturday morning, I guess, I beat the guy in the singles in the morning, and then he goes and runs the marathon, and then that evening I played him in doubles. Um, but uh, I would say this to our listeners is that a junior tennis player wants to tell a college coach that they want to be a pro. I mean, you know, just to play, even if you go, you, you go, you play club tennis in Europe, or I mean, you're being paid. Uh, that's pro tennis. I think when people are playing scholarship tennis, Division One, if they're helping you with your room and board and your uh, tuition and such, it's like you're a pro athlete. But Eric Buterak, what a great story for uh, one of our most accomplished students, Raven Claussen. Um, right. If Raven, like, let's say like, like Agassi, Agassi said he, he finally knew what was going on in his life when he's 29. I don't think that was true with Raven personally, but from a professional standpoint, he thought he was down and out. He already had three knee operations, didn't know if he could play anymore. And and uh, as circumstance goes, uh, Eric Buterak asked him to play, and they had an amazing run where they got to the Australian Open final. They didn't do so well after that, but they got to the Australian Open final, and Buterak tells an amazing story. It's a, it's a TED Talk. People could look it up where, you know, he happened to be in Australia, and he was, you know, 
with, I guess on some type of vacation with his family or college students, friends. And, uh, you know, at that time he wasn't thinking, he wasn't, wasn't chomping at the bit to play the Australian Open. But I think you have to keep your dreams alive. And, you know, what, what do you do in your summers? I do think that's something with uh, Division Three that um, a lot of the young players, you know, they're looking to take an internship on Wall Street. We had um, Alex Vukovic on, you know, his mother didn't want him to teach tennis. So he went, he goes to Princeton, but he just absolutely loves tennis. And uh, he spent his summers teaching tennis with us. Um, but I think that's so important if a, if a kid really, you're only young once and you want to become the best player you can be. You don't have to uh, be first in line for the internships. Uh, you know, what would, what would you say about that comment? You don't have to be first in line for the internships. You could take the summers as a D3 player and work on your game. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge thing I emphasize. I think, you know, the summers where you're, where you're not, the, the results that you're having are, are not directly affecting, you know, your king or any sort of spot or lineup. You know, I think it's such a good opportunity to go and develop your, your, your game, you know. Um, you know, I know you and I talk all the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm sending you guys as recruits that, I'm, that I have. I'm, I'm not, you know, they're going to training with you. And, you know, one of the big things that I – I think it's so important is, is during that during that time to, to go and, and work on those aspects of your game, you know, coming forward and, and your ball is, and, um, you know, I think, I mean, honestly, I think that, you know, if, if you're getting a meaningful internship in college, you know, it's obviously great, you know, but I, I feel like, especially in your first couple of years, it's such an opportunity to go and play and really work on your game so that then, you know, the, the rest of your career, you've set yourself up for success. You know, I think, you you know, if, if you're, before you go into college that summer, your freshman year, you know, even into your sophomore year, you know, if you're going out, you're, you're developing, you know, doing some film, you know, drilling different aspects of your game, and then, you know, playing in some matches to, to finish it out, um, you know, I, I think that those summers are invaluable. Um so, you know, yeah, I would, I would urge players, especially earlier in their college career and even the summer before they go to college, to, to work on their game so that, you know, the rest of their career, they can, they can really focus more strategically in, in you know, their ability to force and, and playing high percentage aggressive tennis. You know, if you have holes in your game, you know, you just, it's like you're fighting a boxing match with, with, with an arm tied behind your back. So, you know, I, I feel like if, if you can, get that figured out in, in before, you know, whether it's before, really ideally before you even get walk in the door, but, you know, especially those first year or two, it, it's huge. In one of our podcasts, I told you this, uh, we talked to Dave Secker, he's actually been a guest a couple times, and I ran yep. this by him, and I, I said, I was talking to him about your situation, I said, well, you know, if I recommended 10 players to go there, they all know each other, because we have students from all over the U.S., all over the world for that matter, but that were there you know, I see them two, three times a year, but I, I train their coach and, and, uh, you know, I think Dave Secker, he was hundred percent right that people are going to, you know, look at you cross sides, they're going to turn their nose up. And, and, uh, you know, we talk about Craig Tiley and his success at Illinois. He was with us for seven years and he took a team from obscurity to the national championship. But when he had his best recruiting class, he was talking to people, um, about, like an Amir Delic or a Brian Wilson and talking to those guys about coming together and winning a championship. Uh, but I, I think that's something that uh, I would recommend is, hey, why don't you guys go to a, a coach? I mean, we have um, a player that you've spoken to. Is, is His coach is uh, emphatic about him going to a school where the coach will be able to support what he's done as a junior. And I do think that for our listeners uh, – you know, so many great, great college coaches, but, you know, how many of them are great teachers, teachers of life, but how many of them are great teachers of technique and tactics? And unfortunately, the number is not very high for, as far as my opinion is concerned, just from experience. But, um, yeah, the, the group of players came in and said, let's go to this place, um, and, and together, you know, we're going to be part of this, part of this program, and... You know, this is what we're going to work towards. It's, it's also the most important part. Students, the first word, student athlete, the title of a college kid, but uh, you know, to put academics in the forefront. Um, but yeah, to get, you know, I, I think the really top programs, um, 
you know, my son played at Ohio State. They were, still are, I'm sure. It's going on 20 years now where they, where they're like, they just, to say always, they're pretty much always in the top five. And, you know, during a recruiting visit, um, it's really interesting that, you know, a lot of college, a lot of, a lot of kids that are already on the team, they're going, I don't want this freshman to come in. He'll take my place. But they're really the championship cultures are bring on the competition. Like, no, we want this kid, you know, well, I'm, I'm playing number six now. And if we, this kid comes in as a freshman, there's a good chance next year, you know, like they do the math. There's only two, two seniors graduating and then, well, there's three really good players coming in. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, to get, to get the people that are in house, the people that are already on the team really, and I hate the verb selling, but they're really pushing the program and trying to get the, the visiting, uh, the visiting students to sign up and become part of your program or part of the program. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, 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 that's where the culture is huge. Right. I think, you know, and, and let's be honest, if you don't have the guys that are, that are like, you know, encouraging the kids to come in, you know, a, they don't really believe that much themselves. So they think, in my opinion, they can't be that good. And two, you know, yeah, you, you want the guys around you to make you better, you know, and move the needle forward. I mean, thinking about all the best programs out there, you know, you think about UVA in the last few years, and USC back in Steve Johnson. And it's like that top, top to bottom, all those guys could have played you once, you know, and it's like, you know, there were guys in the lineup that were top 800 ATP you know, out, outside the lineup that were like top 800 ATP, and you're just like, you know, they, they didn't, they, they didn't care. I mean, it was like they, their mindset was, I, I, I came here, I'm coming here to win a title, you know? And it's like, I mean, I think of Connor at, at Ohio State, I mean, <laughs> playing six, you know? I mean, let's, let, let's be honest. If Connor could have played four or five, you know, spots higher than that. I mean, top 200 ATP after college. It's like, you know, but, but he, he wanted to be a, something, a, a part of something bigger, you know? And I, I have to imagine, you know, if there's a great recruit coming in, he's the first guy to say, hey, come, let's go, man. We're, we want to go win a title, you know? And, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, that, that was the culture at Tufts that we had. I think that's why we brought in, you know, last year the number one recruiting class. It was like, you know, we, we're on a mission, you know, come come be a part of it. And so, yeah, I mean, that, that's the mindset that I have as a kid more. And, and you know, I'm, I'm looking for the guys that, that walk in the door to have as well. It's like, you know, I want to be a part of something special. Um, and, uh, you know, in my mind, the, the kids that are going to be coming in and, and the existing players, it's like, you know, hey, if that kid's better than me, then I need to work harder so that he doesn't take my spot, you know, period, you know? Yeah, that's that's the attitude you want. Yeah, our listeners are, uh, you're referring, Nick's referring to a, a, stu- a story with my son, Connor. He was playing at Florida State at that time. You know, they weren't that strong. You know, he became an All-American at Florida State, but he, he wanted to go to a place where... You know, he had a chance to be playing the big matches, you know, even in his comment was, even if I play six and uh, he was fortunate at Ohio State, he played in, you know, if you count the indoor and the outdoor, he played in three out of four final fours. Um, you know, one thing comes to my mind thinking about Secker, um, I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, group in Canada, flattering, they wanted to build a a real estate project was, you know, housing division and subdivision it was going to have a tennis complex, a sports complex, and they were going to name it Tennis Smith Village. And for the longest time, I called my school Tennis Smith. Yeah. So I, I could pick out anywhere in the country and I picked Raleigh. You know, my parents retired in North Carolina and I used to fly in and out of Raleigh because they were in Southern Pines, right next to Piners. So yeah. quick, quick story, Michael Ogden, he comes in for a visit. So I, I told these investors that, well, you know, I could make a few phone calls and I could uh, go help out the uh, NC State men's team as a volunteer. And, you know, then there was the idea, everybody has their self motives. I think, well, you know, I could do this and then we could also develop a, a, a summer camp for parents and players where the parents come in and they're actually part of the camp and they learn and they learn a, they learn a pathway. So, but anyway, the the, uh, the, oh. no, the number one money guy behind it, he went through a divorce and you, know, you said, well, he's making 600 million a year just because he has to divide it in half. I mean, he's still got enough money to make this go, but it kind of went from the front burner to the back burner. So as a 
third coach, the first summer I was there, uh, uh, Matt Clore uh, was one of the other coaches who I've done so many things with over the years. So Michael Ogden, guy's a horse of an athlete, a championship kid, but he's a great character. So he comes in and he's watching me train these two kids. And it was one young kid from Germany. And um, Michael's father said, my son can't volley like that. And the, the volunteer coach, you're, you can't travel with But I was on campus, so it was like, okay, we're, we're, I guess within the rules, we could have lunch and whatever. And, and then he said, I need to have my son be able to volley like that. And he, he was a three-star. I mean, I, he probably wanted want to hear that because he was a borderline four-star, but he was a three-star. He goes in and he, you know, he did at times play in the singles lineup and he definitely played doubles. Um, but people have to know the parent has to realize and there has to be the understanding that this is what you have to do. Um, it's not a matter of these kids who want to improve their UTR, like just go play more matches. Like, you know, I like, I like the line where, yeah, you're, you know, the boxer with one arm behind his back or you got a hole in your sailboat. Um, you can't build your bridge out of bamboo if people have a really lousy tennis game. I mean, they have, I shouldn't say lousy, but if there's just something that's going to hold them back. Um, you know, I always think another thing too, I, you know, no athletic directors don't want to hear this. I know coaches don't want to hear it, but uh, I'll, I'll say this. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. And it's like, well, okay, go be, go to Div a division three school, go where you want it, come back to Vic Braden, go where you want it, contribute. You're in the lineup. And then, yeah, if you're the best player in the country or best player in Division Three, and you win the national championship. Um, I had a player who played for Emory who, who did that, and he, he really should have stayed at Emory, in my opinion, looking back at it. You know, he didn't transfer to such a high-quality program. You know, certainly there's always things that come into it, like money, but um, the uh, I know that um, – you hear that in the NBA, one and done. But what are your thoughts on that? You, I'm sure you wouldn't want a kid with that attitude to come in, well, I'm just here for one year. But if someone were to say, well, yeah, if you come in and you win the national title, um, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> it's a tough one, Steve. I think, um, you know, I think it's tough because if, if that kid has the mindset of, you know, I want to get better so that I can be, you know, um, I have to kind of imagine that he's probably talking to the guys on the team about the fact that that's his goal. And I think it just doesn't, doesn't, I, I feel like it's tough for them to kind of foster the growth of the existing team um, as much as, as I would like. Um, I, you know, it's hard. I, I think there's a lot of kids that probably would want to come to Skidmore because they, they know they're going to develop a lot. Um, and then, you know, it's going to open up some doors to the, for them that they probably wouldn't have otherwise. But, um, you know, my, my thought is I'm going to make you better than you're going to get at another school anyway. So why are you going to leave? Um, and I, I, I believe if you come here, you're going to have a heck of a lot of fun. So, you know, I, I, I get it. I think, you know, there's some kids that are kind of un, un, underrated and, and maybe getting passed over. And so they're thinking, Hey, well, I'll go develop my game for a couple of years and, you know, Got to open some doors, and, and and I get it. I think I think if they're 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 good for the culture, I think it's I think it's fine. Um, but I think generally, um, I'd love to, to get them for four years because I know I'm going to make them that much better. Um, you know, but you know, I, I think you know you know I've talked about this a lot, but I, I think you made a great point. I mean, you know, you're I'm fortunate enough to to know you really well and. You know, I've started to get to know some of your the coaches that have worked with you and, and you know, that you've, you've mentored. And so I'm starting to get players from them. And, you know, I, I would love, and that's sort of what I'm doing right now, is bringing in kind of that, 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 that big group of guys that are, you know, hey, we want to go win a title. So we're going to go here and we're going to do it together. Um, and so I think the bottom line, is, you know, I don't want to get off track. It's really just as long as they're good for the culture, that's really all I care about. Um, and then I'm just going to make them as good as I can. Coming to ice hockey, um, my oldest brother at one time was the uh, associate GM of the Toronto Maple Leafs. He was the general manager of the Chicago Blackhawks. He was the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets. And the farm team in Toronto, from a business standpoint, and that's what they, you know, the farm team will send the kid down to the farm team. They'll draft an 18-year-old and... Some of the 18-year-olds are so good, they start to play, which is unusual. They'll just start playing right away in the NHL, but they put them in the minors. 
and right. they, they call it the minor league team. And there's different levels, but it's you know farm team number one, farm team number two, and you know the NHL, the American Hockey League is really that's that's the farm team. And my my brother, I can't remember whether it was you know Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, where, wherever the, the the baby Leafs played. Now they're in Toronto, but uh, my brother was in making the decisions with the Leafs. He was like, no, we got to keep got to keep them away from the city. We, they got to have the feeling that they're in the minor leagues. I think with college tennis is the minor leagues. Division one, it's all minor leagues. Division two, division three. If a kid gets out when they're 22 years old and they still have that passion. Uh, Eric Van Dillen, uh, top American player, what he did at one point was continue to work on his game for one semester, but he went to grad school and then he played the next semester. Um you know, you can really think outside the box. If you really want to play, again, you're only young once. Right. Um, with, uh, but yeah, that's where, you know, and I know that um, at NC State, the women's team, they, they the head coach, Simon Urncho, we mentioned that a few times, that it's a little bit, I mean, it's a, not a little bit, it's a crock that, you know, div, Division One college tennis is going to train you for the pros. Um, if that were the case, I mean, you could just go to every major university and say, okay, who, who from this school has been, you know, top 350 in the world, top 250 in the world. And the list is tiny. The list is tiny because, you know, do people really go about it getting better? And, uh, you know, to me, um, I know there's you know, been many, many successful college coaches, but we go back to Jim Verdick. I mean, he coached tennis like John Wooden coached basketball. And that just doesn't happen. I mean, last last weekend, or even through this week, even today, I'm at this ITF tournament in this area in Palm Beach County, South Florida, and um, game based training just with these two different academies that are side by side. I mean, these kids are like 10, 11, you know, years old, and they're just playing baseline games, ball being fed in from the side, and they're just. I mean, they have frying pan grips, and the only thing they're doing is hitting forehands. It's just, it's just, it's just amazing. And, uh, you know, they're having fun. Um, but you know, where, where is it going to end up? Where is it going to end up? But I, I do think that, um, you know, a lot of American kids, I don't think they know how to, you know, they think how, how the club system works in Europe or how the corporate league works in Japan. And there's, there's different ways to, uh, economically, which is also a nightmare is to, to try to play pro tennis. But I think the Division Three players, uh, that's where the Bud Schultz story, the Eric Buterak story, is keep the dream alive. Um, but you have to, be a, have to be an animal. You have to be a practice animal. Yeah, um, you got to I agree. I do think that's a little bit tougher at Division Three to create that mindset, don't you? Yeah, I think it just depends on the place. I think you got to have that outlier place. I mean, I, I was fortunate enough that we were able to create that at Tufts where it was just like every guy there was hungry, you know. We had 16 guys, and I think some people are going to remember saying, you know, God, how do you keep everybody motivated? And it's just like, you, you know, you, you treat everybody like they're the same. You know, you want to get out on the court, I'm going to make you better. And, and I think, you know, that, that's the key at these schools is, is – I, you, you told me this before, and I think it was a great thing that you once told me. It's, it's like, if you feel like you're improving, you know, that's a program. You know, I think players start getting feeling stale with tennis and, and their game once they kind of feel like they're not really improving. You know, it's like, it's just like, I'm just going to go out and feed forehands, and they're doing the same thing, and they're getting the same results. It's like, how, how fun is that, you know? But I think it's, you know, they're like, okay, well, you know, you got – an open racket base in your unit turn and you never get the racket in the squad and you're not getting below the ball. And all of a sudden the kid starts hitting the ball, you know, better than he ever has. It's like now, now, he, now he's fired up, you know? And I, I think the key is just finding a program that, that, you know, that you can go and constantly improve it. Right. No, I, the letters S S D D. Um, we try not to swear on the podcast. I, I'm pretty comfortable with profanity. Having played ice hockey, you know, the kids are, you know, they can't even see over the boards and the, the coach is swearing at the referee. You know, they're sitting <laughs> on the bench and you just see their helmet. Um, but same sugar, different day. And it's, it's just amazing. People keep doing the same thing. Um, yeah. 
said Monica Selish in her book, um, you know, the first sentence is that Einstein's quote, um, you know, you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. But yeah, to, to get better. I think also too is that uh, to take a summer, to take a summer, just work on your game. You know, I don't think it has to be tournament, tournament, tournament. I tell kids all the time that, you know, every day is a tournament. And now, now the UTR, there's certainly some positives, but people are just obsessed, possessed. The UTR is like, shut up. Just, oh just, you know, your, your mind, your mechanics, and your movements. Run, hit, compete. Right. Um, I scribbled this yeah. down as a note. Uh, Craig Tiley, um, he did amazing coaching when he first went to Illinois. Um, yeah. Jameson Hawthorne was number one in Texas in the second division. It was uh, super, super champ, champ, and regular. Terrible names. Football culture. The Super Bowl and the three divisions. Some poor kid had to say, yeah, I'm regular. So he was number one in champs. He wasn't even in the super division, super champs. So he yeah. was recruited. He goes to Illinois, play for Tylee. And that's who Tylee was talking to at that time. I mean, he wasn't, you know, he couldn't get the, the best kids in the country to even listen to him. And, right. you know, he, so he took a lot of sectional level players. They weren't national level players. And he developed those players. But there was one player, uh, and Tylee, you know, coming to this country, he was around uh, so many things his seven years with us. So one was a walk-on tournament. They have a walk-on tournament. And whoever wins that campus tournament, they, they can play the number 12 guy on the team or whatever, number 10 guy. They play two out of three. And if they win that, the number 12 guy is, is off the team. So the walk-on has a chance to, to make the team. I find that's just totally gone away, that there's no walk-on program anymore. But Tylee had this kid named Schwartz. I, kid, you know, I just remember the last name being Schwartz. And when Tylee first got there, I mean, he couldn't get Dick Gould, obviously, at Stanford, even return his phone call. I mean, there was no way that Stanford was going to put Illinois on their schedule, even if Illinois went to Stanford. Uh, that's when he first got there. But this kid, Schwartz, Tylee said, well, uh, if you want to do this, I'll film you. And then I'll give you these three by five cards. And this is the ball machine and you can only use it. Um, it was really the point where you have to be in the parking lot waiting for the janitor to come in. It's a custodian comes in. Don't, don't interrupt him, but you have to be there. If you're there when he opens the door, you're in. But if you're not there when he opens the door and I hear that you're pounding on the door for him to come and get, come and get you, it's not going to work. So he made this really tough program. He had been in the army before he trained with us and his father was a disciplinarian. And so anyway, this kid Schwartz, the way the story works out is Illinois eventually got to go to Stanford and this kid Schwartz. Um, and it was, it wasn't like it happened overnight, but within his four years at Illinois, he won a match at Stanford. And of course, then, you know, somebody will throw in, well, Stanford wasn't playing their top six. Well, if you beat someone who's at Stanford, they're a really good tennis player. You know, like my son, when he was at Ohio State, they had two guys. I know we're going to talk to Ty Tucker, and Ty will tell you that the toughest job for a college coach, I mean, repeat this, I've heard him say it many times, is to try to keep number seven, number eight, you know, to keep the players who are not in the lineup motivated. Um, but when my son was at Ohio State, they had two guys that were not in the lineup that had ATP points. You know, that's, those are, I mean... I, I mean, I always tell people, forget about USTA points, forget about UTR points. You want to be a really good tennis player, there's only one type of point. There's ATP and there's WTA. Play as many matches as you possibly can. You got to win. Don't worry about getting in tournaments. Do what it takes to win. And I mean, I, I still can't convince parents to do that. Uh, I mean, the ITF four, we're at a level four today, grade four, J4, whatever the terminology is. And I feel sorry for the kids. I mean, there's so much money is being spent. You know, it's, you know, they think they're playing an international tournament. And, and I guess they are because kids are from here, there, and everywhere. And, but, I mean, a lot of the kids are backing up to the point where they're hitting the fence. I mean, they're, they're rallies. I mean, um, but, you know, I do think, you know, I, I, I know I come across as doom and gloom going, but whoa. Um, you know, you can watch a match and not see an approach shot not see an approach volley, not see a volley, not see an overhead, not see a tactical play like take the second serve and come in, not see a serve and volley one time, 
and it's like, who's in charge of tennis? I mean, you know, we need to come together um, with uh, the number of people that you have on the team right now. I and mean, how's that going? Yeah, that's been tough. I mean, to be honest, I came in, a couple of kids transferred before I came. And, you know, we started the year with, with five guys. Um, so I let a couple guys try out. Um, and one of them, you know, just a really good kid. And he's all pretty solid. Um, and he's working really hard to just get better and better. So, you know, proud of him. Um, so we, we're up to six. Um, and I'm hoping to get a couple guys in from the transfer portal. Um, so we can have a, you know, I think we can have a you know, really competitive team in the spring. Um, it's going to take a lot of work. You know, the guys have to work in the off season and work really hard. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see how they do. Um, but you know, if we get a couple of the transfers, I'm hoping we do and guys work hard, it could be solid. Um, and then the, the, the incoming class is, is just getting stronger and stronger. So, you know, I feel like the, the program's just going to keep getting better. Um, you know, like you said, you just got to, you got to put the band together, right? Yeah. I, I think that, um, a lot of division three families per se, you know, the, the parents, the player, they don't understand this and they should, you've already said it, you know, how many balls have you hit? And a lot of D three athletes, again, I've been doing it. I've been in tennis for 48 years now and they're played multiple sports. Some of the, like the new England preppies where it's still a rule where they play a different sport every season and they're better athletes. It's like the book range we've talked about. You know, the, the generalist is better than the specialist. I think that really needs to be pointed out. Have you, uh, in your time in D3, uh, known a lot of kids that they, you know, they played college basketball? Last night I was watching a little bit of football with Andres Barbosa and uh, the quarterback from the Bengals. He was an all-state guard in basketball. I mean, so you just know this guy, um, Joe Burrow, I think, is uh, like, what an athlete that guy must be. Uh, right. When you go to a college campus, um, I went to a college where it was 10,000 students, and the, the, the intramural basketball to me, not knowing anything about basketball, was like, wow, this is really good basketball. Intramural yeah. hockey is the most dangerous hockey I've ever been around. I, I, ref, I did lines. I, call, I was a linesman in intramural hockey, and the yeah. people can't even skate. And they're out there with a stick, and they're waving their stick, and it's like, oh, my God, this is the most dangerous thing I've ever been around. <laughs> But um, do you find a lot of athletes at the time in, that you were you played um, D three tennis and you've coached D three tennis? You find a lot of them have played multiple sports. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, I feel like it's rare and rare these days, which is a shame um, because it's like one of the first things I love to hear when I'm recruiting. You know, hey, I played you know basketball and tennis in high school. You know, and it's like I think it's John Isner, right? I mean. Yeah, I, I love kids that are, that are multi-sport athletes. I, I just I feel like it's pretty rare. I mean, we had a kid at Top last year who was a phenomenal athlete. He didn't, he didn't, he played some in the lineup, but I mean, I love getting athletes, and I, I often feel like the kids who are really athletic are often the most clutch. Um, they just they know how to compete. Um, so you know, I, I have I, I haven't I haven't been fortunate enough to have enough of them. I think you know as, as you know, now as they putting together recruiting classes, you know, more and more, um, I, I have something I'm going to look for, but haven't, haven't been lucky enough to have a ton of them. Um, University Liggett in Gross Point, whether it's Gross Point Woods, Gross Point Farms, I'm not sure. It's in Gross, one of the Gross Points. Uh, one summer I ran a camp at University Liggett and Bob Wood, the athletic director, he was a volunteer forever at Kalamazoo. Yeah. You know, he used to, uh, tell a funny story about Aaron Christie who went to University of Liggett and, you know, at 16, he wins Kalamazoo. Then he goes to US Open, wins some matches and, you know, I had a great pro career and he used to say, well, I, I, uh, I taught Crickstein to, uh, Aaron Crickstein to tuck in his shirt, open a tennis ball can, you know, and he'd say, you know, take the top and fold it in half, put it inside the can. And then he'd hesitate. Then I taught him how to hit a forehand. It, which that was kind of the joke because he had he was had such a big time forehand. But what he, what he said, you just said it with clutch, is that Bob Wood, who was in charge of 
you know, all the sports at University of Liggett, he said, I want a kid who's been in overtime, you know, basketball, right. ice hockey, the penalty shot. Um, I want a kid who's got the ball. Vic Braden used to say that, you know, there's two seconds left on the clock. That's the, that's the person I want to coach. And they, they want the ball. They're not thinking about the consequences. And, and I think that's kind of my English. That's gone away because we don't have pickup sports. We don't have backyard sports. We're like, okay, this is on the line and you're, you're having, playing for some pressure. Quickly, I'll tell you a D3 story that comes to my mind. My son, Connor, you know, he ended up being ranked uh, two in the 18s. That doesn't necessarily mean he was two in the 18s because maybe some kids didn't play enough USDA points, but he, he was a very good player and uh, a young guy from the Midwest who was taught by somebody I taught to teach tennis. Um, he went on, he was part of a Division three team that won a national championship. So he's sent down and, you know, I, I, had, I had a basketball hoop up and, and I had him playing basketball. I go, you know, hey, you, 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 you got a leg up on some of these tennis kids because you're just a better athlete. And, mm -hmm. but my, I remember my son Connor was playing him and he just said to this kid, and I don't think to this day Connor knows how much he helped him out. He just said, hey, dude, you're just trying to hit the ball too hard. You know, Nadal, you know, don't miss and be super aggressive. You know, people, you know, speaking to my son, Connor, you know, we get kids to play with their opposite hand and they play better tactically. They're a better player with their opposite hand because they're just trying to keep their ground strokes centered and deep. And then they wait for the right ball to come in and they know they have to come in and they know they have to get their nose over the net. And, uh, you know, from Jim Lair, we, we tell people, hey, we're playing tennis today with our opposite hand and we're not giggling. It's not a joke. Let's compete. And you know that yeah, that is so. Uh, you hear that word clutch. I tell college tennis players, or prospective college tennis players who I've been dealing with forever. You know they're freaking out over a tournament where they're just trying to practice their skills. A tournament's an opportunity to practice their skills, and they're freaking out. And I try to, yeah. I try to create this picture for them in their mind. Can you imagine being in a dual match, and it's three all? Even worse, I mean, it's uh, even better, I should say. Better, better, better. Um, Nicole Erickson, who was on one of our podcasts, you know, the, the more pressure, the better, is a um, mental performance coach. The, so it's, you know, you're in the round of 16, and if you, it's, you're, the only, you're the only person out there, last match, your team wins during the quarterfinals, your team loses, you're going home. And, right. you know, and they're freaking out over a weekend tournament. It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, just to jump in here, Steve, I think, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that comes to mind when we talk about kind of clutch and, and playing under pressure is I see it time and time again where it's, it's just painful. It's like, you know, nails on a chalkboard where kid has a technical flaw in their game and, you know, to be they have the you know they have a eastern grip for their serve they have a palm up serve or you know they they hit the ball outside to in on one of their strokes and and come late into the match and you know if they don't improve that you just know it's going to break down under pressure right and it's just like you know i think that's one of the biggest reasons i have so much faith and and i can't emphasize it enough where you know having good strokes that you know like a clock you know if you have a gear that's out of whack you know at some point the, the clock is going to stop you know telling time the right way it's like you know for kids who just are like you know i want to go compete i want to go play in a tournament and they have these holes in their game i'm just like you're focusing on the wrong end you know what i mean so anyway you know don't want to go on too much about that but i, I just think i, I can't I can't underscore how more how important that is, you know, when we talk about clutch situations. Well, tennis, it's a vehicle for life. And to be on a team, and you said it earlier, to play for something bigger than yourself. Uh, we have a young intern here from Germany. He's been here before, and we're helping him try to secure a, a rat assistant job. You know, it's, right. we have a few opportunities already, which is great. But talk about opportunity. Um, so one of your players is here working yeah. right now. And I said, okay, let's put together a Skidmore test. So I explained to this young German 
I was Skidmore. It's a beautiful college in upstate New York. And one of our associates is now the head coach and we're, we're helping him out. And, um, let's get out the stopwatch. Let's get out the measuring tape. So his thing is sports science. And as a German, you know, in Orgnut, he was studying business and then he decided he wanted to become a fitness specialist. So you have to, in, in Germany, you have to go back to day one and start all over again. So, um, but he looks at it as an opportunity. I mean, he's gone to work and putting the, putting these tests together. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't think that many parents realize, I always say that junior tennis doesn't really prepare you for college tennis that, yeah, you're going to have to run a mile for time or have to run, um, you know, in 12 minutes, you know, how far can you run in 12 minutes? We're going to do the hundred. You go into a, a big university and they have the personal best of, you know, like, like who could be a deadlift. It could be the 400 who, who has the best time. Of course, the, the trackies are going to have the best time on the, the events like the 400, but, um, yeah, I think coming back to stroke production, um, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to work on your strokes. You know, Vic Braden asked Roger Federer one time, how'd you become so good? And he said, I made a list of every shot I had to be able to hit. And, you know, I mean, people should just be like, what did Roger Federer say? What did Roger Federer say? And, you know, people aren't working on their low forehand volley, half volley. You know, they're just, they're not working on those shots. And to just go out and do basket training. But, yeah, I think that's what the culture uh, that you could create at, at Skidmore. Um, Tom Stowe, who taught Don Budge how to hit a ball, and he taught Dennis Vanner to teach people how to hit a ball, uh, the story I heard from Dennis and uh, re heard it from a few others uh, years and years ago. Um, you know, you think you got taught um, Don Budge and Budge won the Grand Slam in 1938. So this is history going back is that his club in Berkeley, California, you know, players or I should say members would get a basket of balls and they'd be out feeding each other balls. I mean, I see kids all the time. They have no idea. They've never fed a ball. You know, they've been to this academy and that academy and can't even feed a ball. They don't even know what basket training is. You know, you feed me 10, I feed you 10. But that's one beautiful thing about, um, you know, I was talking to Natalia Sorkin today and, and I said, well, you have to understand this is how college tennis works. This is one side of it. I mean, yeah. the college coaches, you know, they really don't deal with the parents that much. They really don't want to. The kid's now 18 years old. And the coach can determine whether the kid – um, is going to be in the lineup or not be in the lineup. Right. And, um, and then the, the, you know, they used to say, what's the best thing about private school is you can kick the kid out. And um, uh, Sujay Lama, who coaches at North Texas, he was at Illinois. He was an assistant for Andy Brandy at Florida. He's been in college tennis forever. I took a couple kids to visit him uh, many years ago now, maybe 10. And, uh, tanking. I mean, you know, he had his rules. Like if someone tanks, I mean, goodbye, pack your bags. Um, yeah. With, uh, have you come in uh, being the new coach? You've come in like a hard liner and say, okay, these are, these are the rules. Or you're saying, okay, let me feel this out. You know, you've got people that are already there and you feel like you have to um, massage that a little bit or can you come in and say, okay, this is what we're doing now. This is like, okay, if you're not here on time or you don't do this or you don't do that. How, how's that going is uh, dealing with the, the players? No, it's a good, another good question. I, you know, the truth is I think I came into kind of in a unique situation where, you know, if we had a bigger team, you know, it, and it's hard because, you know, I, I am reinforcing all these values. And I think moving forward and having, you know, some transfers and bringing in some good players next year, a large class, you know, Again, if you have a big a big group of players, it, it allows you to have a little bit more, um, you know, what what's the right word? You know, you, you can again it lack of tall, you know, no tolerance. You know, like again, you tank. I mean, that's another one for me. I mean, if the kid tanks for me, see you later. You know, it's just like I can't stand it. You know, um, yeah, I, th I think I think coming in with you know only five guys and not bringing them on for six it's been a little challenging where you know you want to get these guys to improve the culture and, and grow that that, that accountability and, and just 
working hard. Um, and at the same time, you know, if somebody's out of, out of line, you know, a lot of times we're doing sprints, you know, whereas, you know, maybe if there were more guys, you know, you could see yourself, you know, being like, Hey man, you know, you don't get your act together, you know, see you later, you know? Um, you know, I, and I don't want to be too strict in a sense, but again, I mean, if somebody's doing something over and over again, it's just, you know, see you later, you know, it's just, it's just too, too bad for the culture. Um, I think honestly, the AD has been cool enough that she's like, you know, look, look, Nick, you know, if if, if you don't even have a full lineup, if if it means you change the culture, you know, do what it takes. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm just day by day and the the guys are getting more accountable. I think they're enjoying it more and more. And, you know, this program is going to be, you know, just, I I think it's going to be, a heck of a family as, as time goes on. It's just getting better and better. So anyway, yeah, it's just going to take time. It's going to take quality <laughs> time. You know, I, I think, you know, I, that's right. You know, and yeah, I think, yeah, this, I, I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like, what, what are my three main rules? And I, I think, you know, we had a great thing at top where it was effort, attitude, and, um, you know, team I think there was the third but it was just like there's things that you can control and, and, and every day you show up and what's your attitude like how hard are you trying and you know are you trying to get better you know are you making your teammates better it's like if you're not doing those things I don't I don't want you to be a part of my team you know and so you know next year we'll have 12 guys like you know again if, if there's a bad apple I, I don't again I don't see that person sticking around and hopefully that won't happen you know so that that's that, that I think those take time. You got to cultivate a great culture. You know, for our listeners, these podcasts, I mean, we've now, this is number 117. I'll say this very quickly. I've said it before. I, we do have a group of people that have told me they've listened to every podcast. So I say, okay, we got to have, a, we got to have the, the people who are going to take the quiz, have the podcast test. But I went to the Tyler Junior College from Southern California. Very quickly, a tennis policy was recommended. Um, and I didn't even take attendance. They, what they recommended was six absences and you're out. Two, tar- two tardies is one absent. And But, but the, the students, they changed the rules. I didn't change the rules. They were so bad that eventually the bell rang and the door was shut and you couldn't come in if the door was shut. Um, coming back to one thing you said, you know, we were talking about it. I brought about that one and done. The NBA will all start it. This Division three school, I'll go in and I'll knock it out of the park and move up to a Division One school. We had this program. And you, it's great to hear you say I have a great boss. I had a great boss, Richard Mentor, and um, he basically said, "Hey, kid, I mean, maybe, maybe that's my background with Vic Braden uh, talking about Jack Kramer." But he said, "He said, Steve, you have the ball. Run with it. You know, it's Texas football. You have the ball. You're in charge. You run with it. You're in charge of the program." I think that's one of the greatest things is that it's your program. You you can build it. And you have that chance to make a difference in a person's life. I was, you know, certainly uh, honored that you called me up when you were offered the job and you asked me what I thought. And I said, hey, community, Division Three tennis, go change people's lives. And I, I do think, uh, you know, I've only met Brian Bolin a couple of times. I don't know Brian Bolin, but, you know, like how many, how did he get so many fans when he was at Virginia? And I had a chance to uh, spend some time with one of his assistants at a USTA function. And, you know, he told me his, his first day with Brian Bolin, he thought it was a, a scene from, I'm trying to think of the name of the movie, uh, Devil Prada, what's the name of that? Devil Wears Prada. De- Devil Wears Prada. And, and uh, he said that Brian Bolin was like uh, Meryl Streep's character. And, and he, he, he thought he was just going to go in and they were getting him some free clothes and show him around the campus and, and hit a few balls. And, and he said that, you know, he had to, he was given like a clipboard with, four or five sheets of blank blank paper and he filled them all out, all the things he had to do. Um, but Brian Bolin, you know, that's what I think, you know, you just got to learn, you know, John Verde, uh, Steel Baby Steel, that's what he used to, great guy in Texas, helped us out with training tennis teachers for a long time. That was his definition of research, Steel Baby Steel. And I would get involved with the community. I'd find out who the coaches are in the area. I'd find out who's coaching high school tennis who the physical educators are. I would, if I were you, I would talk to the USTA people that are connected with tennis instruction in that area. 
and you know you want to get fans i would really try to connect with club tennis um you know then what you do in the summer i always tell people that i've trained that and i even said that this would be fantastic if there was a rule in division one tennis and i know that rules it's um how's it go the it's the spirit of the rule okay the, the spirit of the rule is broken um at one point in college tennis in florida junior college women's there was no men's teams at one time where way back when there was 32 i was telling uh ricardo acioli saw him the other day for the first time in 41 years he played at tyler junior college when i was starting this program out and you know now we have two junior college men's teams in florida but um that um to you know really be able to play and play well it's it's the tennis the lines don't know you know the ball doesn't know the net doesn't know um but you know that you're you're a park and rex coach or you're a coach at this famous academy and yeah er, you know everybody's um everybody's part of it and you know to to befriend the the community team and uh you know, I think it's unfortunate that, you know, a lot of times the college tennis players, they don't know anybody outside who's on the college tennis team and reach out and do things for the community. And that all takes time. Um, but, you know, our one of our themes is the highest form of retention. It's not really ours, but we, we stole it. Is one of the highest forms of retention for learning is to teach and get everybody to teach. Um, you know, the player that you have here visiting uh, who's going to be part of your team. We have two young boys here that are five years with us. They've been here for five years. I said, hey, this is how it works. You guys, yeah, you guys can be friends. You guys can be buddies. But even though the, the, you know, the player going to Skidmore is now 18 and these other kids are uh, you know, younger, they're say 15, 16, just a couple years younger. And so it's, yeah. it's, uh, Khan Academy, you know, flip it around, reverse it. So we have the older kids teaching the younger kids. But in, in your case, I mean, to go back to Jim Verdick, you know, he didn't have the guys just clapping their hands and, you know, the, the guys who were not in the lineup cheering at matches. He had them charting. You know, granted, they were getting ice and Gatorade and helping out any way they possibly could. But what was said about a Verdick player is here's a guy, he's charting the match as a freshman. He's doing this, he's doing that. But you come back as a senior, the guy's an All-American. You know, he's a national champion. And, but that, that takes, you know, community. It's like I tell a story about Boris Becker. Unfortunately, he's in jail right now. But Becker um, said when he was 17, he won Wimbledon. He goes, I got three fathers, and I listened to all of them. My own father, uh, Unter Bosch, his coach, Romanian, and then Tyriac, who put it all together, Romanian. And... But I read about Becker's father that he was a pillar in his community and he helped uh, build some public tennis courts. Um, so, you know, to go in and be a college tennis coach and if you're going to be there for, you know, and you should be there, it's like, okay, I got, I'm going to make a 10 year commitment to this place to, to really take a program. I mean, I don't think you, and that does happen so much in division one is most the athletic directors are, um, they're only they're connected with football or basketball, and um, if you're you're connected with a winning team, and I, again I think Ty Tucker does so many things well, but you know so many of Ty Tucker's players are now in high positions in college tennis um, because they're part of a winning team, they're part of a winning culture. Um, but I think that I think with that is is a head coach. Um, it's just like if you were in the business world, you know, like, okay, this is, this is where the business was when I started and, or this is the assignment I was given and this is how I, how I turned it around. Um, I one time uh, with a tennis club, it was in bad, bad shape. And I, I was asked to, if I would help um, turn it around. And that's what we named the newsletter, we named the newsletter turnaround. You know, because most things have to, unfortunately, they have, some things have to do with 180. You know, tennis players, I mean, your backhands, you got to, you know, you got to go in a completely different direction with how you're hitting it. Um, what are you going to do in the off, in, I shouldn't say the semester break? What do you do as a coach who's building a program during your semester break during the summer? 
during the summer or the winter, Steve? Uh, both. I mean, I think, you know, that's one of the things with, uh, you know, college coaching, um, you know, as, as of November, because of tests and whatever, you're, you're actually not allowed to coach your players until January, correct? Yeah, yeah. So you go fish, Probably. you go fishing, what do you do? <laughs> Probably my least favorite role. Um, you know, one of the things that I've kind of done is, is those guys can, can do things like film matches for the and and um, chart matches, and, and then, you know, they can bring in their video, we can go over it, you know? Um, oh, you can do that, so you can have meetings with them. Yeah, exactly. So I just do, you know, I can have meetings with them and continue to help them de develop and, you know, just, just using, you know, working around it, you know, you know, and don't, not breaking any rules, you know, so, but, but being able to be productive, you know, so, you know, there's a guy on, on our team who hits the inside of the ball and it's back in, and, you know, I got to help teach him how to hit a true top on that side. And so, you know, he'll film himself and, and get better there and, um, you know, can help him, you know, um, I, I think the, the, the thing is I just can't get on court with guys, you know, so, um, you know, and that's, that's the big thing. Um, it's a shame, but I think, you know, if you're in touch with other academies and, you know, like I said, I mean, I think some of the guys on our team are going to come and see you over break. So, you know, I think if you're fortunate enough to, to get other people involved, um, they can have an unbelievable experience, you know, um, so again, that comes down to the leadership of the team as well. I mean, we had a great system at Tufts where, you know, they played three, three days a week. They competed against each other. It's on, they had this whole, you know, the whole system of, you know, they were kind of divided the team up into different teams and then they were competing against each other in the off season. And then, you know, they were doing two workouts led by the captains outside of the, the training. So I'm, so I'm building that here, you know, so, you know, even though I can't get on the court with the guys, you know, if, if they want to get better, you know, I'm here. And, and you know, being honest, I, I, I'm the only guys I want to bring in are the kind of kids who want to get after in the offseason, you know. Yeah. Um, my train of thought, I'll go back to the, the spirit of the rule. Um, so the, there was a time where uh, 15 years, Hillsborough Community College, 10 years we uh, – I oversaw, directed the women's team and yeah. Ch Chad Burial, the second five years. I mean, the first year, uh, you know, he was new and you know, he had to come in and, you know, we would add 14, 15 year olds that, you know, knew more about the X's and O's and nuts and bolts, but a real hardworking guy, sharp guy. So I'd say the last four years, he just had autonomy where we certainly helped him out, but you could only have two girls that were foreign players, but there was one school and they had all foreign players. And they, they had, they, well, this one's on a presidential scholarship. And so did they break the rules or the spirit of the rule? I remember when we would host that team, I would say if everybody would, uh, uh, during the, you know, the, the lineups, the players introduce themselves. If you could um, uh, tell us your name and where you're from. And, you know, you'd have eight players. Or, you know, not one of them was from the United States. Um, the, uh, but anyway, the spirit of the rule. Um, Craig Tiley, uh, I remember what he did because there's so only so many hours that you can work with your team is that uh, he would video a kid and, and, and show him what to do. And this is where there was no restriction. It's during the, I don't know if it's 20 hours a week or whatever it is. And, you know, he would film a kid, you know, spend 15 minutes with him and go, well, you know that when the ball machine's available, we'll see you tomorrow. And just get, you know, so they weren't part of the practice. Um, you know, I could, could be slightly off on some of those details, but, uh, with, uh, you know, one thing with that, we were very close to what he did because, uh, Jennifer Roberts, who was with us for two years, she went there before him and she was instrumental in him coming there. So we were, you know, really big on working with the, the women's team and the men's team. And the first time Tylee ever went there, I went up there to run a, Labor Day weekend for the women's team. And he, he went with me as a support coach. Um, let's come back to fitness just for a minute. I mentioned the German uh, Skidmore Fitness. He's looking at it as an opportunity. And the, just for our listeners, you know, here's a young guy in his 20s. And, and I said, well, you'll be able to tell people that you did this for the head coach at Skidmore College. And, yep. you know, so he's all over it as an opportunity. 
even if even it's just an email and you know you look at it and say thank you or there's some things that you uh implement into your program do you have the support staff i mean i think when you go to a division one campus um it's like you're walking around olympic village i mean what do you have i mean obviously you know prestigious school you have the support staff academically but your athletic department what do you have as far as trainers and i did see where you have uh physical trainers but you know for your tennis team you want help off the court on the track in the gym how's that go yeah you know we have a great we have a great strength and conditioning coach matt um who, who our guys work with a couple days a week um does a lot of stuff in the gym um you know Honestly, a lot of it is kind of thinking outside the box, outside of that, um, is, you know, it's, a lot is on the coach, you know, and I mean, I, I personally pride myself a lot on, you know, the team that I coach being the fittest in the country. Um, that's my mindset. So, you know, at Tufts, we, we were huge into fitness, um, you know, last, and I've just brought it here, you know, um, Carl kind of put me in charge of that there and, um, you know, I, I made it as tough as I could, really, you know, while also allowing guys to recover for matches. Um, and it, 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 it was instrumental in, 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 in pivotal moments. You know, we, we played against CMS in the quarters of NCAA last year. And, you know, our guys were, were, were tough physically and, and, you know, came late stages of the matches and they were cramping and we were ready to go, you know. And so, you know, the same mindset's been here. You know, we try and, we, we, we do fitness, you know, basically every day on the court. I mean, in one way or another. I mean, I'll do drills a lot of the time. I don't want to give away all my good drills here. But we, we do a drill where, you know, if you miss wide or in the net from behind the baseline, you run a touch from one single sideline to the other. Um, you know, if, if you know, because those, those balls should be going to high percentage, you know, aggressive targets, you know, percentage posts, basically. And, um you know, if you don't get up to the short ball, you run a sprint. So, you know, constantly having the mindset of, of forcing. So, you know, that even just drills that we do, I'm, I'm implementing fitness all the time. And then usually I'll, 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 I'll put, we'll do fitness three days a week um, outside of the workouts with the trainer. So, so it comes to basically five. Um, lots of stuff to work on explosivity and, um, you know, tennis-related movement core. You know, before the podcast, I was at the uh, FAU, Florida Atlantic University track with uh, yeah. maybe eight players. And again, I sound doom and gloom. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, a couple of people that have played tennis for years and years and they have no core. They they just have not 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 done any running. And that's with it, I think, in Europe overall. It's a, um you know, I think of my son Connor being in a town I mentioned earlier, Vexo, Sweden, and they, there's this lake. It's like three miles around, and you know, my son Connor would be complaining because we, sometimes we run around the lake three times a day. Hey, we're getting organized. I just go run around the lake. By the time you come back, uh, we'll have it set up. Here, here's a note that comes to my mind thinking about Ty Tucker, and I, as a, you know, you get the clock out. It's not like I've been around Ty that long. I mean, for that many times, my son played there. You know, I, but I think going way back to Jeremy Wurtzman and go, tell me a story, tell me a story is, you know, the little ladders they use on the tennis court. A lot of times they use that word little. Ah, oh, he's a nice little yeah. player. Ah, oh, he's got a nice little serve. But <laughs> the, the ladder, the ones you just lay flat down on the court and where they yeah. come from, and they come from football players where the coaches go to the, you know, the junkyard or whatever, and they get all these old tires, preferably large truck tires. And the football players, they have to run. They got to really pick their legs up to run through these tires. And, you know, Ty Tucker, I, he just goes, I hate those things. You know, and his whole thing, and I think it's, you know, something that I, I've always liked is that let's do some sprints with a tennis skill at the end of it. You know, like if you get on the baseline, unfortunately, too much pounding on a hard court, but you just, you know, you, you take that braid and feed and just tap the ball down slightly like you're taking a drum, a stick to a drum. You just it just gives you the feeling that hey that's a great drop shot and they have to run in for the drop shot, r run backwards, working with the legs. Um, you know we almost all day long now when we pick balls up, it's three and three backwards. You know just you, you know like, just run backwards. You know get up on your toes. Luke Jensen when he ran practice, it's been three days with him. He uh, when he was at Syracuse, 
when he would run practice, his girls' heels could never touch the ground. There's so many things that you can find as far as fitness goes. Um, but no, to speculate, it's like, okay, if you do this and you do that, you know, where, where is this going to be? You're a young person. I'm an old person. I'll tell you a story of speculation. Um, not, not too often do I find myself at Everett's Tennis Academy. Uh, I'll be, I'm sure I'll be there tomorrow. And I was there 30 years ago. Exactly. And I was a director of tennis. It was Seguzo Bassett. And I know it was uh, Dave Anderson, Dion Krupe, uh, Mark Voss, and there was a few others. And then we were there ready to teach tennis. And, um, and I just think of the, the Braden influence, Vandermeer, Burwash, all these people. And it, it, again, it's not a shot at Everett's, but just the academy program today. Um, you know, there's so many pictures of Jimmy Everett on the wall. I spent three days with Jimmy Everett. And, um, you know, overall, I mean, you know, the way Chris ever hit a tennis ball, I mean, I think people would make fun of it. I mean, she won 18 Grand Slam titles. I mean, she won, uh, you know, big time doubles titles. I think I made a mistake with... Uh, I know I made a mistake with Lindsay Davenport, but I believe that Everett, I, I bet lunch on it that she won Wimbledon and the US Open playing doubles. But uh, the way she hit a ball, oh yeah, granted, you know, uh, she could hit a little more top on the forehand, but she could hit the thing on a dime, 125 matches in a row. And um, regardless to speculate what, what, you know, like what Anderson's done with developing college players is if we had been, you know, allowed to make the vision that we had. Um, but the thing was, is that my lifetime, I've been in so many meetings with, okay, there's eight people at the table and what's the agenda for every person at the table? You know, well, this person just wants to make money. They know nothing about tennis. They only care about the overhead and has nothing to do with the overhead on a tennis court. But I think that's one thing about your situation being the head coach. It's in a lot of ways, it's, I mean, you have to start, you have to comply with, you know, the policy and procedure, the rules and regulations, the protocol, the standard, the traditions of Skidmore College, but it's basically your agenda. I, I guess, why don't we end it there? Why don't you tell us, uh, you know, to summarize, uh, what's your agenda? What's Nick White going to do at Skidmore College? You know, I, I think, I think it really comes down to creating, you know, creating a culture that, a, a winning culture. Um, and I, I think, I think the first thing I'm, I'm, I'm looking for is guys that are hungry, um, guys that just love to play, you know, people that want to play in the backdrop, you know, that don't, that don't default and, and want to get the extra rep. Um, you know, I, I think kind of the core of, you know, almost the way I think of my philosophy is, you know, if you're hungry and athletic, oh, I'll, I'll make you a heck of a lot better. And, you know, I, I look for players that, you know, have good strokes, you know, that like to come forward and they love to play. You know, I, I don't focus, you know, that much on their ranking. Um, you know, it's great if they have a good ranking. You know, I've certainly brought in some good players. But, you know, I care about how somebody competes and, you know, how resilient they are and how much they make the people around them better. And so, you know, my my plan and and – uh, you know, my goal is to make every guy that, that comes through here, you know, somebody that, that other people feed off of and, and they feel like they max out their game, um, you know, both by, you know, the drills we do on court, the filming that we do, the film review, you know, having a, having an understanding of why different strokes break down so that, you know, they can have a really good game plan, you know, late in the match and just doing it time and time again. Um, and then, you know, creating a family. Um, so, you know, really want to create a family here. Um, I guess the last thing I, I'll say that I'm pretty excited about too, is I'm, I'm going to host a new tournament next year here where it's going to be called the East versus the rest. And, um, I've invited the, the best teams from the Northeast and the East. So I have, you know, Middlebury's coming, Wesleyan's coming, you know, Tufts likely is coming. Um, you know, I've invited Williams, I've invited John Hopkins, and then, you know, uh, teams outside of the East and the Northeast, I invited, um, 
you know, Chicago, Case Western, CMS, Trinity, Texas, Wash U, um, NC Wesleyan, Emory. And so basically we're going to do two big draws, singles and doubles. Each team puts eight, eight singles players, four doubles teams. And, um, you know, we see who ends up on top. And, and I think it's a great, a great opportunity for people to play against, you know, other players from teams they'll see in the playoffs. And, you know, my, my hope is that I can provide these guys with the best competitive environments they can get. So, yeah, super excited. Oh, that's great. Excited for you. With uh, Again, thanks for taking the time. Uh, I love what you said. You want people who love to play. And, yeah. you know, just play. You, you know, um, you're going to play X amount of sets. Chuck Freese was a guest on the podcast. And recently, his captain was one of our students. And, you know, you can't, I guess you don't start coaching to X, you know, September 10th or whatever the rule is. And, you know, he said, okay, I want you to play 100 sets or whatever, 50 sets. I want you to play, play, play. And, you know, we touched upon it. George Goldoff last week, we touched upon it. Um, you can play and work on your game at the same time. You know, there are, there are times where, okay, you know, you need to take a serious amount of time off from competition, but, um, you know, unfortunately it's, you know, too many times, uh, you know, kids play and they're, you know, the brain's got two sets of motor programming, one with stress and one without, and you have them play and, you know, they can't, they can't work on what they've been working on in the training sessions when they play some sets. But, um, anyway, there's so many takeaways from this, but yeah, we'll, uh, check in with you again. Now, I know I talk to you on a regular basis, but, uh, uh, pressure, Billy Jean King pressure is a privilege, but it, uh, that's now you're the head coach. We're, we'll, we, like others, are going to evaluate what happens with tennis, the men's team at Skidmore College. Love it. I love it. I can't wait. Yeah, Steve, thanks so much for having me. I, uh, you've been a mentor for me for years. So I, uh, you know, this is an honor for me and it's always exciting to talk to you. So um, thanks. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking to you soon. Nick, thank you very much. And I, I didn't tell anybody uh, that uh, you're related to Walter White. That's a question for you. Do you know who Walter White is? No, who's that? Well, that's, that's good that you don't know Walter White. It means you don't watch a lot of TV. During the pandemic, uh, Andy Fitzell got me to watch uh, Breaking oh, is Bad. That break? Breaking, Breaking Bad. Bad. Have you watched Breaking Bad? I, I, I've maybe watched one episode or two. I, I, people keep telling me to watch it. I... I, I uh, you know, it's funny. I haven't, I haven't spent that much time watching TV these days. Well, I'll tell you what. With that, I'll end with a captain, Captain Kangaroo. All right, our young people should look that up. Captain Kangaroo was on TV for 30 years. He was Sesame Street before there was Sesame Street. And Captain Kangaroo said, "Parents, don't let the TV be a babysitter." And Good. that's what parents today need to hear. What Captain Kangaroo said is don't let technology, don't let the cell phone, the computer game, the iPad, be a babysitter. Anyway, sure. uh, that's my Australian background as I was part of the Captain Kangaroo morning morning show. But yeah. uh, again, Nick, uh, we'll talk to you soon, but I appreciate taking the time and I know our listeners uh, will be very uh, appreciative and listen to what you had to say about you and your new challenge. All the best, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Good night. Take care. All right. Nonsense. That's a great word. Nonsense. Common sense. There's, 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 how's it go? There's no common sense. I'm having a brain cramp right now. I have a lot of them. It's not common to have common sense. It's not common to have common sense. But anyway, 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 thanks for listening. I don't want to take any more time. But with our long podcast, uh, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Uh, we'd like to consider it part of our, our free education, and we hope you're getting something out of it. I know I did. Again, thank you, Nick White, and good night. Adios, amigos.